And now, holy shit, folks. I always remind people, you know I am suspended for life for minor <laughs> hockey. <laughs> it's my duty to please the booty. Did you catch a rattlesnake and then drive home with it in your car holding it the whole time? Yep. Phil only drinks Coke. He doesn't drink water. I fucking quit. Fugazis. Fugazi. Fugazis. Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 430 of Spit and Chicklets, presented by Pink Whitney from our friends at New Amsterdam Vodka here in the Barstool Sports Podcast family. Ahoy, ahoy, everyone. Hope you're all doing great out there. The trade market has heated up. The wild card race in the East is crazy, and we had a goalie goal this week. We'll get to all that shit in a little bit, but of course, we got to say hi to the fellas first. Biz Nasty, let's go to you first. What's up, my buddy? Guys, Hawk and Lugs, too. There's a lot going on in the league right now. I'm excited. I don't even really want to talk about my personal life much, although I do have a pretty insane story, and I'm a little nervous to share it. I teamed up with Mm. Pasha first. You guys will love this one. Mm. You guys might think I'm a complete fucking lunatic um, for the way I handle this. That's that's old news. Okay. Well, to judge my my social skills on this one, so um, I go to, uh, to do my gateway loop hike, as I normally do. I go hiking as a, a de-stressor. I go to work on my breathing, calm myself down, and just like an overall workout. I, 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 I do certain paces. Sometimes I run at the start, but it's ultimately to, to get my mind right. So it's been a pretty crazy couple of weeks, a lot of travel, a lot of doing this, a lot of doing that. So I get to the hike and I got to take a leak. I got my water bottle and it's called the Gateway Loop. I think I might've already mentioned that. It's about five miles. Um, it was Saturday, so a little bit busy. Um, so when I leave the car, like automatically I'm in my head going through my workout and how I want to approach it, whether I want to run the first little bit, uh, this nasal breathing I've been starting to do, I have a horrible nose, eventually going to get the Ryan Kessler, uh, surgery that he got to help his sleeping. But the, the nasal breathing definitely helps me as far as like getting my, my cardiovascular up and it helps me sleep at night. So going to take my piss before the hike, uh, I get in there, there's a guy on, on the right urinal, there's three urinals. So I you know, whip out my horn, start the hose. This guy lets like the biggest fart go. I'm so in my head that I'm just thinking about my workout still dialed in. Another guy walks in on the left. The guy on the right is still there uh, p- pissing. I don't know if he had stage fright, whatever it may be. Keep in mind, he's the one who ripped ass. So still in my own head, I finish my piss and I start walk, grab my water bottle off the, 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 like where the sink was and start walking out. I forgot to wash my hands. This guy who ripped that fart goes, dude, wash your fucking hands. So just as Fuck it clicked him, in, dude. Bro. Fuck just him. As it, just as it clicked in, I'm like, oh, fuck. And I, I start washing my hands and he walks up. But when I turned back around the corner, I, I looked over to be like, like, first of all, who the fuck would have like said something like that? And he's like, he gives me the, like the look around and like starts shaking his head while he's still to piss. Then he walks up. I'm washing my hands and I look at him and I say, are you out of your fucking mind? And he's like, what? That's disgusting. Wash your hands. I said, are you out of your fucking mind? And then he's like, what? You turn around and wash your hands. I'm like, buddy, I'm about to go on a five mile hike in the desert, snotting all over myself. And you're fucking worried about me washing my hands. I ain't going out there to dab guys up. I'm going out there to snot on myself and get my fucking workout in. And then, so he kind of kept holding his position on it. Bro, I, I, I'm washing my hands, flicking water in his face, saying, I, is it, I just say- Just hoping he does something. I, I, How did I, you not I, bring up the fart he just dropped in your mouth? Bro, I was I was on my heels so much, and I, 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 I wanted to knock this guy's teeth out, because I just would mind your and own fucking business. That's not what you business. need pre-workout, right? That's like, funny. Looking- I, I was thinking about it for half the hike, so I'm already rattled. I get, I get out there. The guy who came in to the left was a biker guy. So he does the path with the bike and, and he, he was waiting outside the door. He didn't wash his hands either. He just got the fuck out of the bathroom. Cause we were both at the sinks going at it. And finally I walked out. He's like, Oh, he goes, I thought somebody was going to come out sideways. And the way these places are, are built by these hikes, like you could hear everything. And there's like families around, like looking at us when we walk out of the bathroom, I'm ready to kill this guy. And the, the, the biker guy had my back where he was like, what the fuck is wrong with that guy? And of course, just a, a, an absolute Karen type character. He has his family with him. So I, I, cooler heads prevail. I thought I said my piece by basically challenging him. I said, on the way out of the bathroom, I'm like, you're trying to shame me. He's like, 
for not washing my hands. He's like, I, I wasn't trying to shame you. I'm like, bro, I turn around the, the corner and you're scoffing at me, shaking your head because I didn't wash my hands before a five mile hike where I'm about to grind my cock off. Like, fuck you, you piece of shit. So sure, sure enough, I figured, hey, I might, might see him as I come around because it's a loop. I, I, I pat myself on the back for this one. His kid says, hey, mister, as, as I'm walking by Follow him, I didn't say a word. The, buddy, the, the old man says, don't talk to him. <laughs> and I, I, I wanted to teach him a lesson and pull his jersey overhead and just feed him some uppercuts because I feel like people get way too comfortable trying to tell strangers what to do in public. So I thought what, I'd what, what that was one. his height and weight biz? He was, he was about Not that it five. matters because there's UFC killers who are little. It doesn't really matter, I guess. If you're, if you're a lunatic, you can beat up anyone. But what would he, what he look like? 5'10", chunkster, love handles, like going out of oh, style. The old dummying for you. The, the old muffin top all around him. I could have, I could have done, I probably could have done three full loops of this thing until he d did one. Cause I basically met him at the start along, along the other side. So I just, sometimes like, I just feel like people just need to shut the fuck I, up and stay at other people's like, business. What the so fuck is he I, I just care figured, to wash your hands? Like, oh, I, I, does it boys, make any sense? I, I'm, I'm actually shocked that I didn't knock this guy's teeth out. So I'm glad I'm here. I'm glad I didn't. And for those of you who would have knocked his teeth out, maybe try a little bit more hiking, a little bit n more nasal breathing. Uh, Biz, when you say bikers, you mean like Hells Angels or like Greg LeMond? No, they do the, they put their mountain bikes on and they go oh, okay. around because it's a big rock path and, and you can go deeper, you can go deeper into the desert, but I, um, Cooler heads prevailed. Oh, that's good. Take a couple deep breaths, flick some water in the guy's face, and I think that I got my point across. <laughs> if I'm wow. taking a smash, I'm washing my hands every time. If I'm taking a piss, rarely, if ever, come at me if you want. I don't give a fuck. If, if it's I'm a gross rest bathroom and it's one of those ones you actually have to flush on your own, I'm washing. But if I'm just touching my horn, unless there's piss all over my hand, which I'm an adult, so I probably like shouldn't be peeing on myself, I'm walking right out of that bathroom. And, and and if somebody said something to me like that, like I'd be the guy to go at him and then get beat up like he's a lefty and pumps my eyes shut. <laughs> Don't be telling me to wash my hands. Seriously. Huh? I'm, I must have said, are you out of your fucking mind 40 times? <laughs> and at the point where by the end of it, because he kept trying to push his point, I was yelling. Oh, to, yeah. Like, I was in his face saying, are you out of your fucking mind? Gee, can That's you not type picture of guy this, how he gets, you know, how he gets angrier and angrier? I could totally see this entire scenario. Yeah, he just, he gets those killer eyes where yeah, he's he just like the, looking yeah, the, the through wires you. Cross. <laughs> the wires cross. The wires cross. So, as Tony Soprano calls them, Manson lamps, like fucking Charles Manson. Okay, I like that. I like that go. term. Oh, Manson lamps. Well, anyway, anyway that, that's all I had really going on this weekend. Uh, had a nice Coyotes game Mike. as well. Yeah, just a... Just a nice one. Uh, Mur murdered a family. <laughs> uh, next up, let's go to the Wit Dog, Ryan Whitney. That's a foreign bedroom I see behind you. Where are you these? These this yeah, weekend? Mom, this week, I met my parents. Um, they bought a nice condo in Estero last year, which is about 25, 30 minutes north of Naples, I think. And it's beautiful. It's on a golf course. There's tennis. There's pickleball. It's a great spot. You know, Q-tips everywhere. If you know a Q-tips, an old person with white hair. So it's, it's constantly just, <laughs> you know, they're just walking all over the place. But my parents seem to love it. Came to visit them um, after this long trip, which was Fort Lauderdale and then in, in Clearwater. Clearwater Beach. We stayed at this sand pearl resort. It was phenomenal. It was right, what a beautiful beach, Clearwater. Holy shit. It's like California. So wide. Um, they got very lucky that that hurricane ended up, you know, missing Tampa in that area. Could have washed away the entire, the entire strip, I guess. But... Uh, it was a lot of fun. Played in that golf tournament. Played like shit. Shocker. Hit the wrong ball in the first round. Was playing with this guy. He's the man. A big time uh, mid amateur golfer. His name's Tug. His name's Tug, boys. I'm like, Tuggy. Um, we were playing a one with a blue dot. And I was like, oh, whatever. It'll be fine. I have a line over the putting stripe. He didn't. He actually tells me a couple holes in. He was in the lead of this tournament a few years back and he hit the wrong ball. And the other guy hit his ball. So they both got two shots penalties. And I'm just laughing. I'm like, all right, whatever. No big deal. Well, we're both short right of the first hole. It was our 11th hole or 12th hole. And he just walked up to a ball and he's like, oh, he shook his head. No, no, it's you. So I went up. And now, mind you, I'm totally admitting this is 100% my fault. And like something like this happens once. It'll, I'll ne it'll never happen again. I'll never make this mistake again in like competition. Well, I didn't really look. I just kind of trusted him. And he told, he felt horrible, dude. 
but I putted it up to about an inch and I was just going to knock it in. And he's like, oh my God. I'm like, what? He's like, dude, that was my ball. So he didn't even get a fucking penalty. He didn't even get a two shot penalty. So I, 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 I shot 80, then 76. I, I'm just so average at golf. I have a before mental get, block. I, 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 get I'm not even going to get into it. I'm not even going to get into it. But it was, it was, it was, it, this tournament's incredible. I, I've mentioned before, thank you so much to the Gasparilla Tournament Committee. Um, it's just a blast. It's so fun to play in. There's fans out there. There's drink tents. It's, it's just scoreboards, like I mentioned. It was a blast. I wish I played better. Um, but it was still really fun. And then we drove down We drove down here, and I'm out of here Wednesday. So it's been a, it's been a long two weeks. I'm kind of really ready to get home. One of those situations where vacation's awesome, but you're just kind of like, oh, I just want to go back into my routine. Unfortunately, I'm going back to a house that's being demolished basically right now, so that'll be fun. But still, it'll be nice to get back. There's a huge snowstorm, I guess, coming, in Bo- coming to Boston tonight and Tuesday, so I'm going to kind of miss that. I'll get home with snow on the ground, which I don't mind. And... Um, other than that, oh, something funny happened. So this resort had, that's why I, th- I thought of Sam Pearl. So they had, I don't know, I guess it's normal, but they had like a mermaid show up to the pool for the kids. Cool. So this girl's like swimming around like mermaid. Like she doesn't have feet, dude. She's got Bringing the an R.A. memories She's back of hedonism. <laughs> fucking yeah, Daryl yeah, yeah. R.A. was pounding a mermaid. A <laughs> merman. Merman. <laughs> Just don't turn <laughs> into a fish. Just don't turn into a fish. <laughs> <laughs> so, um... <laughs> Like, she's whatever, she's talking to the kids. I think she read a story, she's swimming around. Kind of bizarre, but I guess whatever. The kids were into it. Girls seemed oh, to be she? into it. And weird, weird, like pink hair, kind of weird. But um, she's sitting there, and I'm like kind of nearby, and I can hear, and the kid's like, where are you from? This little kid, wise ass too. I could tell he was a wise ass. I loved him. She's like, Atlantis. He's like, Pfft dollar store version of Atlantis. He must have been seven years old, dude. Oh. I started laughing. Oh, shit. So that cracked me up. But it was fun because, um, like I said, the beach was awesome. Great food. Great room service, which is something that is, like, big time underrated, I guess, when you talk about hotels. I ordered a New York strip with, like, roasted veg- ro- roasted potatoes and a vegetable medley. And I'm like, I don't know, you know, like, just room service and steak. This thing was unbelievable. This steak is, is, I ordered it again the next night. I'm like, I don't want to go out to dinner because I got this room service. So it was phenomenal. And uh, other than that, oh, and then my parents gave me this. One of the most bizarre gifts of all time, but it's pretty funny, I guess. I I could tell it was a painting or a picture. I was like, oh, probably a nice one of the beach or something. Nope. Tim Jackman? Oh. (laughs) Oh, what? That is is weird. It's my face on Jon Snow. Oh, my God. I, I still don't really know, like, where they got this idea, but I don't know where this is going in the house. If I hang this up in the house, I may get some divorce papers just handed <laughs> right over right in my face. But still, hey. I guess Ryan stands for Little King, and they took that as King of the North. I'm King of nothing, I'll tell you that. Whoa. King of three putting. But <laughs> my what? My teeth look great in this thing. Look at this. They do. Boom. They do look good. Damn. Yeah. They should have so put the lettuce. I'm just going to leave this here, guys, for the whole pod and talk to you. Just punch they, a hole in sh- and talk through the hole in the painting. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, so and, your and, wife and, has already seen that. Then I was going to say, if, if 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 she hadn't seen it, maybe put it above your bed for when she gets home and, and oh, surprise her. Oh, you can't her. see the bottom. She's down there. She's actually rubbing my feet in the painting. It's pretty cool. So it was much respect to her. But no, she's um, definitely filing. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah, she's done. But um, no, no, more than anything, guys. Like I, I cannot get over the NHL right now. I know we no. constantly talk about just getting to the playoffs and this being p- kind of the grind type of the season. I would say we're a little bit past the grind because now it's trade deadline, then it's sprint to the finish, an amazing race in the East. And what the hell is going on in the West? Is somebody gonna do anything? I mean, we got a couple little rumblings here and there. But my other thing is, is Don Waddell asleep? Did Don oh, Waddell sir. like is? Uh, the Carolina Hurricanes and their fans, like, what is going on? So we can he get shares into a everything. timeshare with Lou, and, and he's in the same spot that he was this summer. <laughs> they're, they're on the ultra Russian ambient, and Don Waddell <laughs> hasn't picked up his phone in two weeks. So the Hurricanes, Jesus Christ, guys, you get a chance to win the Stanley Cup. You haven't done jack shit. No, so, he's actually uh, in that dark room that Aaron Rodgers was in. He's going to clear his head. He's gonna do a, he did a full week. No self service, no nothing. He's clearing his mind, figuring out what the right move is for the deadline. Only only juggernaut team in the East really not to do anything. Uh, they better do something. 
we can, we can get into Pittsburgh later, but I was really referring to the top six. And I know we still got to throw it to G and, and, and yep. talk to RA here. Wit, I thought you were going to go through every single stroke that you had at the Gasparilla <laughs> Golf Tournament before we got into the hockey. I'll just leave it like this was the whole week. I The first hole, I striped one down the middle. <laughs> I had 105 yards in. The pin is back right. It is four paces. You get the sheet. It's four paces from the right, which then drops down. It's a really hard up and down. There's 40 feet of green left to the pin. I miss it to the right. I don't get up and down. I did that like seven times to the point where I was aiming left of the green, knowing my club has just is so late right now that I was blocking everything and still continue to miss it to the right. So it's just, it's like, Dumb, dumb, dumb yeah. mistakes, but I'm not even mentally making the mistake because I'm aiming to the fat part of the green. So if I do miss it left, I can get up and down. I'm still missing right to right pins. It's just a disgrace. I don't want to get up. I don't want to get mad. I don't want to get upset. <laughs> and I want to talk hockey. So I feel it. like the wow. first 20 minutes of the podcast has turned into our therapy sessions. Seriously. Where we just let out all these uh, these panic attacks and these crazy scenarios. Uh, what's I made one you? birdie in 36 holes, but it's one yeah. fucking birdie, dude. <laughs> That's Grinnell, like, what's bugging you? What's happened with you, well, buddy? Uh, I mean, a lot's bugging me right now, to be honest with you. Things have been pretty crazy for me. Well, first off, quick shout out to my dad. Happy 61st birthday. Guy's nice. an absolute legend. Love my dad a lot. But number two, my, my apartment right now is an absolute disaster so i'm moving to hoboken this week so nice moving for the ninth time in 10 years so but this now you're off. a homeowner i i am a homeowner ah, shadow cross congrats. country mortgage congratulations, congratulations buddy congrats, congratulations buddy. thanks guys thanks guys it doesn't happen without you and it doesn't happen without the chicklets fans coming to live shows buying merch so i love the chicklets fans but like i said my apartment is like an absolute it looks like a hurricane went off in here the only thing fully set up still is my desk I'm like, we're not taking it down until I do game notes on Wednesday. So, uh, yeah, life life is pretty crazy for me. I can't afford to pay rent in this city anymore. So I, uh, I looked across the river, hit up our friends at Cross Country Mortgage, and decided to buy a little apartment in Hoboken. Mortgage is cheaper than rent now, so it's I'm excited. He's nice. bunking up with Jack Hughes. They're going to live together. <laughs> Timo Meyer, I got an extra pod. room for you, bud. Hoboken, uh, Frank Sinatra's hometown, right? Gee. That's where yeah, he's from, and right? maybe potentially RA, the new home for Timo Meyer, new Devils, new Devils oh, uh, oh, oh, trade. Oh. Segway City G, gonna jump right into it. By the way, wait, how good is Gasparilla? Did you go to any of the parties around? No, Tampa? so I think that's actually a couple weeks prior. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah. Um, I think the actual Gasparilla celebra- celebration weekend is before, so this is just still called the tourney. Maybe it's kind of all of February's considered that time in Tampa, but yeah. Um, no, I didn't get to experience the the, the real festivities. It's yeah, it's a bit. pirate party, and yeah. I would say that it's a, a classier version of uh, Mardi Gras. Yeah, I think uh, anything is classier than Mardi Gras. Yeah. But yeah, I think that's a pretty good analogy, even in Florida. <laughs> Holy shit, uh, Biz! I, I knew you would want to check in. I I, I did the opposite of a. Uh, I know you microdose on occasion. I you know with uh, for yeah. the mental health. Yeah, I, yeah. I I impromptu had a macro dose the other night. I I forgot I had a couple of uh, boom booms stashed in my draw somewhere now. I had a good time the other night, man. I was uh, I was feeling it. You might say it's a, it's amazing sometimes how a, a big macro dose can just completely change your mindset. You go get fucked up. You have a lot of laughs one night. On the other hand, hey, I'm not recommending everybody try it. I would I would consult a professional. I've had a buddy who who took a macro dose one time and it fucked him up for like a year, where he ended up going into a depression and couldn't figure it out. Where where uh, I believe he believes anyway from talking to doctors that he consulted with was it, it threw off his body's chemistry and his brain's chemistry. So he ended up using other drugs in order to get out of that depression. Oh, Jesus no, no. Christ. I, wait, wait, I know you're laughing, buddy. I know you're, but uh, what are what are some of the drugs that the, what the, that he was talking about that he used Heroin? to do it? No, not. No, like what, MDMA? like benzo, benzos or something? Like so take the MDMA edge MDMA is something that you can use. What's the other one that it feels like you have the moon boots on? It's also, it, oh, ketamine. Ketamine. Oh, yeah. It's another Christ. another process where hey, I've actually tried ketamine before, like partying. It is a yeah. nice time. You can't take too blast. much of it though, because it'll really fuck you up. You just gotta take like these little tootskis, and then you're good for about an hour. Yeah, and for all you kids hour, listening out there, that's chicklets. <laughs> yeah. I'll, if you I'll get say. real fucked up on one drug, do another one. You'll be <laughs> back to back to perfect in no time. Back to normal. I'll tell all you. Right, what did you do on it? Um. 
it was yeah, it was kind of late at night, very spur of the moment. But you know, I I had the urge. I watched some uh, nature shit on Netflix, like the stuff with like the monkeys and the birds. I was like, holy shit! And then I kicked back the recliner, dude. I never realized how like trippy Octung Baby, the U two album is. I put that on, and man, I was feeling it, seeing all kinds of stuff. It was it was a good time. I, I had a little blast what, by myself. What's it called? You know the U uh, two album, Octung Baby from uh, what ninety ninety two, the old yeah. album. Oh, I, didn't I didn't realize know that was the name of it. I didn't realize there's well, I don't know if it really has any psychedelia in it, but I certainly was feeling it that night. But yeah, man, it's good to flush the brain out a little bit and uh, you know, fucking why not? When in Rome, why not? Exactly. <laughs> uh, I think Yans texted me one uh, one of those nights. I don't know if it was a night that you were on shrooms. He goes, Are you watching RA's Q and J session right now on Instagram Live? I delete my Instagram app quite a bit now. He, 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 it's it. I've tuned into a couple of them. Ra, you just rifle off on the comments and some of the people telling you to clean your room. You're like, ah, go fuck your mother. <laughs> hey, I think the best part is I always watch them too. I'll tune in and you always see Keith Yandel three is joined. You know, Yand's <laughs> watches like every single one of them. But it's, fu- it's funny because the thing it's it's like so fast. I I don't even know who's on because you know I'm not. How like, many people are tuned into that? Ra. When I first get on with it, probably gets up to maybe like three hundred. Of course, I'm doing it like two in the morning usually, and then it, it kind of slowly goes down and goes down. And I'm like, all right, once we go into thirty, then I'm it's him stop. and Keith. <laughs> <laughs> but that's yeah, just it, him and Keith doing an Instagram Keith's live in the room together. Me just he's just staying on his phone. <laughs> no, it, Keith's wife's like, what the fuck are you doing out here in the living room? You're waking up the kids. He's like, I'll be all right on Instagram. People seem to dig it. It's you know a little fun fun activity to do on the side. Plus, you know a little. Yeah, you know, what do you call it? Rat a tat, quick answer and quick it's answering a spit questions. It's chicklets rabbit hole, man. It's just yeah. one of the extended pieces of entertainment we offer. It doesn't matter. It's a it's like a little a speakeasy society, the Q and J club oh. on RA's Instagram. <laughs> That's a fucking perfect way to put it. Before we go any further, gotta talk to you guys about New Amsterdam's own Pink Whitney. I was walking along the beach in Clearwater on what was that, Thursday or Friday, and I saw um a young lady just rip a shot. Of Pink Whitney. I said, oh, you enjoy that? She said, this is the best drink going. She goes, ever since it came out, I hammer shots on the beach. I make mixies with a little bit of soda water, and it gives me a great buzz. And I said, no shit. I appreciate that. I'm actually the guy. I'm Whitney. She said, yeah, all right. She sonked me right in my face. What am I going to do? Try to convince her? Nope. But she knew, along with millions of others, how wonderful this drink is. And not only is it wonderful, we now got the big Whitney. That's a 1.75 monster bottle. This thing will last you at least a week, even if you're a big Pig Whitney drinker. The thing's enormous. It tastes great. It looks great because the bottle takes up your entire friggin' room, and it's now available. So we appreciate everyone for drinking Pink Whitney on the beach, in the snow, on the course, on the ocean. Doesn't matter where you are. Doesn't matter what temperature you're in. Get involved with New Amsterdam's Pink Whitney. Thank you so much for jo- enjoying it. Thank you so much for trying it. And thank you so much for just being a part of the Pink Whitney family. So New Amsterdam, our presenting sponsor, thanks to them and thanks to you. Pink Whitney, the Big Whitney. We do talk hockey on the show, so we should probably yep. get to that. Also, we do have two guests. Uh, we have Dylan Strom of the Washington Capitals. We're going to talk to him in a little bit. And uh, we also have GM Joe, uh, GM in quotes, the guy who crashed our potty down in Fort Lauderdale. We brought him in for a job interview and to figure out what the hell he was doing down there. We'll get to that a little bit later. But first, Friday is the trade deadline. The market heated up quite a bit over the weekend. Uh, one potential trade we've been hearing about for a long time finally went down. The Devils acquired Team Homaya from San Jose in a trade involving nine players and four draft picks. The 26-year-old Maya is in the last year of a four-year, $24 million contract. He will be a restricted free agent this summer. He's got 52 points in 57 games so far. Uh, they also got defenseman Scott Harrington, a trio of prospects, uh, and a fifth rounder in 24. San Jose kept half of the salary. Uh, they ended up with forwards Fabian Zetterland, uh, Andreas Janssen, a pair of Russian defenseman prospects, and a bunch of picks. But Meyer, of course, is the centerpiece of this whole deal. Huge addition for the Devils. Uh, Biz, I'll go to you first. Does New Jersey need to make other moves uh, to contend, or is this going to be it for them, or what? Well, I don't know if, if they're done quite yet. I would, I guess the only other thing I could maybe recommend as another defenseman. Uh, I don't think they're going to get to upgrade a net, although, I mean, talking to Pasha, he's pretty much brainwashed me. He thinks they're all set to take on the Rangers with this move. Uh, the only thing that scares me is the fact that they weren't able to lock him into a contract, given that the haul that San Jose got back. Uh, but 
everybody on on New Jersey's side seems confident they're going to be able to lock him in. I don't know what number he ends up getting at from Pasha's standpoint. Some of you people are like, who the fuck is Pasha? He's the biggest jock sniffer Devils fans. We've used one of our deranged uh one of our videographers he's on the, he's been on twitter all day chirping at the rangers so he he is chomping at the bit to get them in the first round but we're not sure how that uh, the vision is going to end up playing out but overall fitz fitzy went out and did exactly what he needed to do in order to solidify that lineup going into playoffs to give that young group a chance to take that next step i like the aggressive move i think timo meyer uh, he's a point of game player maybe even a little bit above a point of game player um, you know, wins battles. He's good on the four check. He can make plays as well as put the puck in the net. His numbers have been consistent over the last couple of years. So him coming over, I don't really have any, uh, I guess, worries about him dropping off. And I think he's going to immediately impact that lineup. And and much like the Rangers, there's enough attention going around up front as far as guys having to carry the load, especially ones with those young, fresh legs. I think that that this is a very dangerous team, and if I look at them playing the Rangers in the first round and that plays itself out, I would probably put the Rangers, just based on goaltending, at a 52% advantage. Very, very slight just because of goaltending. I think that their back end is okay and fine. I would like to see them potentially add something else besides that, but probably the the biggest name left on the board, knowing that Patrick Kane's going to end up going to the Rangers, so... All credits due to Fitzy for turning this thing around. I thought that they were going to dip after that amazing start. They fought, Even after they were deal- dealing with some of those injuries, they were right back to their winning ways. They've been consistent as of late, and adding a guy like that is, is exactly what they needed to do. So, Whit, I don't have really much else in that. I think that everybody expected him to go to the New Jersey Devils. It seems a- a- as if, though, maybe Carolina was in it to a certain point, and we're going to get to them later, but... They had enough. And to to get out of this without having to give up Mercer or the sixth overall pick in Holtz, I think is a massive, massive win. The one kid, I can't even say his last name, R.A., uh, the the big defenseman, that seems to Nemec. be the... How do you say it? Nemec. No, there was another kid. Maybe I'm, maybe it wasn't the, the, the longer name. Oh, the, the, the yeah, the, the, the Shadur or something. Yeah, I, I can't say the name. I, I could say Nemec for fuck's sakes. Come on, give me give me some credit here, G. But that seems to be maybe the only guy that people seem to think he's going to be a, 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 a solid NHLer at some point that they were maybe a little bit concerned about getting away with. But uh, uh, the other, Zetterling, is that how you say his last name? Zetterland. He's a, Zetterland. He's a solid physical, <laughs> physical player. I mean... But that's Another somebody guy, at this point you're willing to yeah, part you can, with. You can definitely part with. Built like a cigarette machine. I, I There was nothing that stood out about his game where I'm like, ah, oh, Rand, they're really going to miss that guy in the lineup. They got the guy they needed, and now we are headed for some absolute juggernaut series in the East. This is, not to be hyperbolic about this situation, this is the strongest that I believe a conference has ever been going into playoffs, at least its top six. And if fucking Pittsburgh ends up making a move and that core group can get things going, look out, man. The East is absolute absolute insanity. I described it as a cage match, hell in the cell type atmosphere. It's going to be lunacy. I, I love this move. Um, I cannot wait for the first round to start. But Meyer, he's a game breaker, dude. And he's not just great around the net. He's he's awesome because he's physical too. He's a big guy. He's hard to move off the puck. He goes and gets the puck back. He's constantly in the offensive zone. And now the thing is with New Jersey, it's like, all right, say he ends up playing with his fellow Swiss countrymen in Heeshire, right? It's always Heeshire and Meyer on the ice, and then it's Hughes and Bratt. So now all of a sudden you have the two star centers, and Hughes is just at another level, but he sure is a hell of a player, the captain of the team, the guy's great at both ends of the ice. But one of those guys was always without Brat, right? It was it was one of the centers had Brat, and then the other center was kind of just working on his own. Well, now it's like at all times, not at all times, when the third and fourth line are on the ice, you know what I mean? But those two top lines, it's an elite center and an elite winger. So it just gives them the combo of two different lines of having four different game breakers on the ice. And Meyer's just so good because of how physical he is. I think he fits in perfectly. He could skate well with Jersey. He's exactly what they needed. And I think they wanted to do something in the summer, but they were able to just wait it out, wait it out. And like Biz said, everyone kind of the entire time figured he'd be going to Jersey and they ended up getting the deal done. So great job by Fitzy. But 
Go look at the goal Meyer scored against Anaheim this year. He falls down, gets back up on the rush, snipes one. He's just he's an awesome player. And he's young. And yeah, the the qualifying offer is ten million. Hopefully they can get him locked up long term. And obviously the cap hit they're hoping isn't ten million per season. I don't know if he's necessarily worth that. But in terms of this season and what they need to do and what they're trying to do with what every other team is loading up with in that conference, that's a hell of a move that gives them a legit chance to go on a little bit of a run. I'm going to be on the Rangers in that series mainly because it's just Sturkin. Um, I can't believe I'm going to be with Avery Zaretsky oh. in terms of rooting for the Rangers. <laughs> but let's not sleep on the fact that Carolina hasn't done anything. I think they'll do something, but Jersey's only three points back of them. Right. So who knows what Meyer does when he comes in, continues to light it up. I mean, he's been great this year for San Jose. Now he goes to a legit, really good team. I can only imagine his numbers are even better. His possession numbers will be even better. And playing against him is difficult. It's not just the size and the speed. It's how physical he is and how he's willing to take a hit to make a play and also be pretty good on the other side of the puck in the defensive zone. So an awesome deal and an awesome player that's now a devil. I, I know we shouldn't get ahead of ourselves because at this point to the home stretch, getting that first seed where you get to play a wild card as opposed oh. to going against whoever the top three in that division are is going to be huge. So I'd imagine you see all three of these teams pressing hard to get that one spot. And as you mentioned, man, the other two teams have made their deals. And, and I don't know what Donnie Waddell's doing. I, I, I tweeted out, somebody get the guy a bump. The party started here. <laughs> you got you to gotta, you gotta get going. And sometimes people forget, like, Palat's been injured a lot of the year or was out for, for, for a, a big majority of the first half. That's a huge add with that experience. And I feel like as, as well as Halla did with, with, you know, puck retrievals and, and being a guy who could fit in the top six early, I don't think that that was sustainable. So he gets to get bumped down and, and, and line match more appropriately in the bottom six. So their top six completely loaded. I love that fourth line and the chemistry that they have going. Miles Wood's a guy that they can also provide that physicality. And, and I think you, you touched on it when you were describing Timo Meyer, where he's not, he doesn't shy away from the physical play. And if there was one complaint I would have had New Jersey about going into playoffs was maybe that they were a bit soft. So hopefully they're not going to get pushed around the way that people expected and they put up a better fight if, in fact, they do play at place off the Rangers. The reason um, I don't know how confident Rangers fans are in their, in their overall top four compared to against New York, but with the way that Marino has came over uh, from, from his Pittsburgh days where last year might have been a, a bit of an off year and him in, in, in Graves... I just look at New York, if healthy on the back end, Keandre Miller, uh, Lindgren, Fox, and, uh, and, and Truba as a, as a better top four than the, what they got. So that's just my opinion. You guys may disagree, but and, the, and then obviously the Mikola pickup as that fifth, sixth type guy with some big size back there. I just lean towards them goaltending and defense wise. And when you look up front, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. I also think that, and granted, like I said, there's a chance that they don't play each other in the first round, but if it does happen, for me, not only is it the goaltending, it's the fact that the, the Rangers, they went to the conference final last year. They've kind of been there. They're adding Patrick Kane at some point. The Devils, it's, it's one of those things. You have these struggles, then you get in. The first year, there's not a ton expected. You haven't been in the playoffs. All these guys, they don't really know the level it takes where you got to up your game. And the Rangers last year have been through it. And then adding a three-time legendary cup winner like Kane, it, it, for me, I think the Rangers are. I think the Rangers in that series, RA, if they do play, will be minus one fifty. Uh, that yeah. much? Yeah. Oh, okay. I do. Wow. All righty. Yeah. All right. No. On the goal. Yeah. I, no. I, I'd say about that. I mean, just on the goaltending alone, you got to give the edge to, to Shesterkin. Sh- I know he's been struggling lately, but you know, I think he'll be fine once the playoffs roll roll around. But it is cool. It's cool for the Devils fans, and it, it, it's like it's been a long road, and all of a sudden this year the, the expectations were higher, but they've completely exceeded even their own fans and what they thought they could do. So then to go out and get a game-breaker, you feel happy for a fan base who had all that success in the 90s and early 2000s, and it's been a tough go lately, and now it's like, all right, not only are we in the mix here, but we're adding this guy. It, it's a cool thing for a fan base to get to experience that sort of excitement. And we've alluded to it six times, but if this trade doesn't go down with Kane, talk about the biggest blue ball cock tea special in the history of the National Hockey League. Avery's, Avery's going to be cruising around with a wheelbarrow carrying his balls if, if that trade doesn't go through. The whole the whole playoff run. It, it, it's well, going to happen. 
It's going to happen. It's, it's happening what's today, Tuesday. I know it, when it drops. If, if, it, if it hasn't by the time the show is, it, it's going to happen on so Tuesday. So I, right. I keep, you, you know, Elliot Friedman's, the, the, he's the guy, Merrick's awesome, the 32 Thoughts and all the other insiders, they're kind of saying Wednesday, but in terms of like what's happening, I don't feel for Chicago, but you got to understand, this is exactly what happened with Claude Giroux last year. When Colorado really wanted him, he said, I'm going to Florida or I'm not going anywhere. And Patrick Kane has made it clear, I'm going to the Rangers. So it really kind of puts a, a bind in terms of what the Blackhawks can get back, which I think is going to be, unfortunately, not that much in terms of like a superstar Hall of Famer getting traded. Blackhawk fans are going to be like, what the fuck's going on? But when you have a team and you, you're able to kind of hold them hostage in a sense of like, this is where I'm going, they really have nothing they can do besides get whatever the Rangers are willing to give up because it's either lose them for nothing or get some sort of return, even though it may be really weak. So it, 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 it's a position that keep Patrick for Kane has afforded himself, Biz, but still it, it makes it tough on the Blackhawks. Yeah, okay. I think you meant keep them for nothing, correct? Sorry, sorry. Yeah, we have lo- no. yeah keep them and then lose them at, at, at UFA this yeah, summer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, all right, do you want to tee it up? I, I, you basically broke this trade. You said 99% this is happening. I mean, you you refused to to take association with the Rumor Boys last podcast, and you stuck to your, your big J oh, journalism. He was on shrooms, though. I, no, <laughs> not that time. I, you know, I, I, love, I love you boys, but, you know, my, my training was, I was the newspaper nerd at school. I, I still have that in me. And, no, it, I don't fake it. I mean, I'm a fucking weirdo. I got a lot of quirks, but I don't make stuff up. I don't lie, especially something like that. I, I Source did tell me it's 99% done. Talked to him today. He said it's happening tomorrow. It's 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 in the can. And it's going to go down tomorrow. Well, t- today Tuesday. So, yeah, it's going to. I by the close of business Tuesday, Patrick Kane should be a Ranger. That's. No, I'm not, I don't think I broke it. I know it's all. Oh, everyone knew what was happening, but I, you know, I I wouldn't fucking say I could have done it nine million times with other trades. That ain't my. Well, Ari, let's There's... start with you. What type of impact do you see Patrick Kane making on Broadway? Uh, I mean, fuck. I, I don't know if he's enough to put him over the top, but I mean, he's Patrick Kane, man. I know he's a little bit older, hip bother him, but. That's a huge pickup. I mean, I don't know where they're going to slot him in. I presumably with Panarin, uh, with the, what's his name, the bread man there, Panarin. But that's a huge pickup for them. But um, plus with Tarasenko, still though, I don't know, man. I don't know that that's enough because everything gets tighter in the playoffs. Defense gets better. And I know I just said Shostakov will be better in the playoffs, but you know, I don't know if Rangers fans are shitting their pants a little about his play lately. But yeah, I, I don't know. They don't they don't scare me even if they get King. I guess. Wow. Whoa. Yeah. They don't scare you at all. Man, I think they got yeah. I think they got a hell of a hockey team. Now, I will say in talking to a couple fans, I don't necessarily think right now the uh the thought on Tarasenko so far has been anything that special. I don't know how well he's actually played since he came over. They had a huge win yesterday against LA or Sunday, excuse me, but Kane is such a difference maker and the fact that he had the slow start and he was battling the hip injury and and he made it clear to people, like, this hip is not as bad as everyone's making it sound to be. But, all right, now I really got to turn it on. I want to get traded. I want to figure it out. Dude, he's got 10 points in his last four games. He's on a run right now where you got to think he's feeling healthy. He's excited to get out of town. I know that sounds crazy. It's probably super emotional whenever this does go down. But you get Patrick Kane in MSG. And I'll say, I've said it before, I love playing in Montreal. There is nothing like the buzz of MSG. It's the pregame tunes. It's the lights. It's walking around Broadway and Manhattan and just showing up to the arena with all the action and all the atmosphere. And I think he's going to go there and light it up. I think he's going to be unbelievable. And I think the Rangers could win the Eastern Conference, no problem. I mean, that's coming from me. Uh, it, 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 I think that there might be still a debate on who is the best American-born player of all time. I think that Patrick Kane's a sick puppy, and he wants to be at the top of that. I think that this is this is going to be his, his Mona Lisa moment where he's going to go over, and he's going to have sheer dominance come playoff time. And I'm scared for it, obviously, with you know the little rift that we have going. I refused to ask him a question the other night, by the way, when we were on TNT. I'm staying firm on, on the clown and... And him coming against the rumor boards. All right, that wasn't a shot at you. That was a shot at us three. No, I know that you're, you're really not in that category. But it's almost like uh, they, they, how they used to say about Jordan, like late in his career during regular season games, he'd have to find a way to get himself going. It's almost like he was nixing the trade. Then Tarasenko got picked up where he was basically in control of it all, but then yet got pissed off. It, it's just like... He he needed something to motivate him, like the kid, like the eleven year old kid in the crowd, maybe throwing a chirp at him. Where MJ's like, "All right, motherfucker, I'm going to put up fifty tonight in, in Utah." 
you know, with the with the guy with the Carl Malone jersey looking at him like, yeah, yeah, motherfucker, I'm gonna light your ass up. And I feel like he that that's what we've seen over the last last four or five games of him working himself up. Let's not let's not kid ourselves. The first forty games of the season, he looked completely disinterested in Chicago. There were even games as the the trade deadline was coming too, where not back checking, just lazy stick checks. Where now all of a sudden he's leading that Chicago team to victory, while him and Max Domi are pretty much the only two showing up. So I think that he's going to go over there, and I think he's going to solidif- solidify himself as the greatest American-born player of all time and help to take this team on a run. I, I think he's, I I he's going to take off there. I think he's going to be unbelievable. I'm scared shitless of the New York Rangers right now. Wow. I think that they, they are going to be an absolute wagon. I put them just below Boston in the Eastern Conference. Now, with all that said, with those two trades that they've made and how much they've leveraged the future, that's a lot of fucking pressure on that team right now. So I'm interested to see if they can handle it. Last year, I felt like they surpassed expectations. Now the expectations are even higher than they were. Let's see if they can live up to them. All right. When you mentioned that you're not really afraid of them, I know you're kind of saying that as a Bruins fan, but does that mean you would be picking the Devils to beat the Rangers in the first round? Um, shit, I didn't think of that. I mean, to, I'd have to see the lines first. But um, Or did you only mean if the Bruins ended up facing yeah, off with them yeah. in the Eastern Conference Final, you'd be like, we're, we're, we're moving on to the yeah. cup? Yeah. I mean, okay. again, it's not a disrespect to Kane. It's just, you know, they're a great team. I, I've given them, given them their props, but, you know, I, I just... I don't know, that doesn't as a bees fan or whatever. Yeah, I'm not. I'm like I'm not sweating. I guess is the, uh, the way to put it. Uh, but speaking of the Rangers, uh, in order to facilitate the the presumed trade uh, for Kane, they s- sent forward uh, Vitaly Kravstov to Vancouver for forward William Lockwood in uh, Vancouver's seventh round pick on the 26. Now the Rangers have been doing this crazy cap stuff. I don't know if you saw the game Sunday. Uh, they dressed Braden Schneider and Ryan Carpenter. They sat on the bench, but they didn't play because. They couldn't send them down, but they didn't want them to get hurt because, you know, they didn't want to fucking lose them. And the Carpenter got 13 seconds to play because he he uh, sat for Miller's penalty, which we'll get to in a second. So the Rangers have been doing all this fiddle-diddle just to get the cap right, and they thought they might be screwed after what we saw yesterday with uh, Keandre Miller. He got a match penalty for spitting at, at Drew Doughty. Um, it was kind of like, oh, man, th- this guy's been such a good citizen uh, on and off the ice. People were shocked by it. And he, he he did meet with Doughty afterwards, and, and Doughty, I guess, was receptive to it. They, I guess it was a good conversation per Molly Walker from the New York Post. Uh, Miller does have a hearing with DOPS today. People are expecting a suspension because of precedent when, uh, Garrett, what's his name? Uh, Garrett Hathaway, Hathaway ended up Hathaway. doing it when he was in Washington. Exactly. So people are, are expecting that there. So that was maybe going to affect the cap situation, and it, it still may because the Rangers lost Ryan Lind- Lindgren on Saturday after T.J. Oshie hit him. So the bottom line is the Rangers might be fielding 15 guys for a game, but I don't think it's really a big deal because they're kind of locked in that spot anyways. But uh, what, what was your take on, on that incident with Miller? I, I, yeah, I mean, it was ugly to see, but I mean, if that so was I, I, okay. I'm going to take it, I'm gonna take it as, as, for, as him for his word in that he did not, it was totally accidental. Now you watch it, it's like, how is that accidental? But, but for him to say it and then from all accounts and including Miller's statement that he released – Doughty was kind of receptive, as you mentioned, to like him telling him, that was not on purpose, that's not who I am. Quick little side story, my buddy Fairway Foles, everyone knows Foles the prankster, he's, uh, I don't know if I've mentioned this, he spit in um, somebody's face in three different sports in high school, in football, he was at the bottom of a, a, a whatever they call that, a little scrum in football, Pink spitting pile. the kid's face, uh, spitting the kid's face in hockey in the winter season, and then in baseball, in the ultimate spit in the face move, he hit a foul, he hit a pop fly, and the first baseman was waiting to catch it. As he rounded first, as the first baseman was looking up at the ball, he spit in his face. Maybe the three scummiest moves of all time. But Foles is a competitor; he'd do anything to win. But <laughs> spitting in a man's face, I mean, in terms of like the most disrespectful thing you can do, I would say it's right there, maybe number one. So for Miller to come out and immediately say he was so sorry and they didn't mean to, I- I'm gonna believe him. Um, I don't know. I don't think he'll get suspended. Maybe a fine. He was kicked out of the game, but just a crazy move. Like, if you're going to spit in someone's face, you better be ready to throw hands. Now, the thing is, Foles will throw hands with anyone and pretty much dummy anyone I know. So he was willing and ready. Nobody would step up to the plate after getting a loogie shoved in their mouth by the Foles burglar. But I think that Miller was honest in his apology and that I, I'm just going to take him for his word, right? If he says he didn't mean to do that, he didn't mean to do that. It's just kind of awkward timing to have him standing right in front of you and all of a sudden you spit at him. I don't know how that ends up working. 
Yeah, I, the, the internet took it to a completely different place, but uh, glad they got to, to chat afterward. Um, one of those things that probably follows you around for a couple years, and, and it does suck regardless if there was an, an intention or not, um, given the fact that they did speak and then he, it, it, Dowdy seems to believe that it was accidental, I wonder if they take that into consideration and, and, and talk amongst, amongst the de- Department of Player Safety. So if not, obviously I, I, I assume that he will gam- get a game or two, but uh, if, if, if Dowdy's okay, I think it should be on Dowdy's call and say, hey, if he doesn't actually think it was, it was on purpose, they should just kind of give him clearance. And, you know, I think that he, the, the, everybody handled it the appropriate way. It was was a Hathaway sh- suspended shitty- when he did it? Oh, For yeah. Games, I think he, yeah. he straight up just, I think, did it on purpose. And as I said, yeah. that, that followed him around for a little bit. And I think since then, he's he's cleaned up his act, uh, depending on which maybe which fan base uh, you ask. Yeah. But, uh, you, Ari, there was a couple things you mentioned there that uh, we got to dissect. Uh, also, them losing Lindgren. Yeah. And people were not happy about the TJ Oshie hit. I would say definitely hit, hit him in a vulnerable spot. Sometimes at the pace of the game and when things are slowed down, he he definitely came at him from the side, but by the time that he made contact, it looked like Lindgren had already been turning in. So the way that he went into the boards, probably a little bit too close. And um, I was was not crazy about the hit, but definitely one of those borderline ones where I don't want to, you know, I don't want to hang him on the cross for, for what he ended up doing. A very, very difficult loss if they end up losing Lindgren long term. This is a defenseman for the New York Rangers who block shots. He's a honey badger, plays way above his size. I know I know he's probably the other than Fox, he's probably the smallest guy in the lineup that they have, but he plays way above it and is just a, a great leader in that locker room and and he's nails. I think if push came to shove, he wouldn't have a problem dropping him with most guys in the league. So a, a great top four that you can't afford to lose come playoff time. So let's hope that uh, he's not on the shelf much longer. Yeah, Gallant was very upset about the hit after. And if you remember, uh, R.A. And, and G will know, I mean, Lindgren was kind of a toss-in when Rick Nash got traded to the Bruins that year. Nobody really expected that much, but what a player he's turned into. And you described him perfect, Biz. Kind of a heart and soul guy for the Rangers when I look at that team, especially looking at the run they went on last year. Just playing through injuries, just battling anyone. So they cannot withstand to not have him. I have heard it's more of a day-to-day thing and they don't expect a long-term injury. But what a player he's turned into and what a big-time factor he can be for the Rangers killing penalties and just playing good defensive hockey. Wow. Boy, he's a fucking on fire today. Yeah, we're, uh, we're going to go uh, jump over to the West for a second. Uh, Nashville right now has 64 what? points in 57 games. The West? What I? They stink. The West. the West stinks. The oh. only <laughs> chance the West has is either Colorado, who's now crushing teams, or if the East just beats the shit out of themselves so much and business hell in a cell first three rounds that they just have nothing left come the Cup Finals. So, uh, yeah, Nashville, they're six points back of Seattle for the second wild card with two games in hand, but it looks like they're going to be sellers after all. Uh, they traded Nino Niederreiter to Winnipeg for a second rounder in 24. He's got uh, 28 points in 56 games this season. Let's see. He's in the first year of a two-year, $8 million deal. He's been a 20-goal scorer six times in 12 seasons, so Winnipeg will juice that offense a little bit. Uh, the Preds also potted with uh, rugged forward Tanner Juneau. Uh They sent the undrafted 25-year-old to Tampa for uh, defenseman Cal Foote. Tampa's third, fourth, and fifth-round picks this summer. Tampa's second-round pick in 24 and Tampa's first round pick in 25, uh, top 10 protected. Uh, Genoa, had, what's he got? 14 points in 56 games. A little bit of a uh, slack from last year. Making 800 grand. He will be a restricted free agent. But, Biz, uh, what do you make of this deal? Some people think Tampa overpaid. Do you agree? Uh, yeah, I think that they did slightly overpay, but given them circumstance, and wait, you sent a, a perfect tweet of the breakdown by Breeze Bois that, that, that's exactly what I would have said about the, 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 the trade. Can I read that the, to you? Yeah, as you tee it up, that top six and that core group of guys, so look at the top six forwards they have, completely solidified, awesome high-flying offense. This is exactly what they did with Coleman. This is exactly what they did with Hagel, although Hagel did jump jump into that top six where they get these guys on these great contracts. They do give up quite a bit, but a guy who is a useful player to their specific lineup. And Breezeball obviously thinks that these guys have earned the right to compete again. Who gives a fuck about the future? Now, on top of that, the year that Janot's been having has been a complete off year. Uh, based on some of the analytics I'm seeing and from watching games that he's played, just a bit snake-bitten. He's still getting his opportunities. 
But we keep talking about these line matchups. Well, he gets to go onto that third line who is extremely, extremely heavy now. He's got Nick Paul as, an, as a centerman and a guy who had a coming out party as far as playoff per- performances last year in uh, Ross Colton. That's a that's a big line that can move, that can shut down a line for the Maple Leafs, a top two line, right? So that's who they're looking at as the team that they're going up against. As a Leafs fan, that move scares the shit out of me. Uh, as far as what he gave up, go back to Breeze Boss comments as you could tee up. This is what he sees as what he gave up. So necessarily not maybe a haul to him with. Yeah, and I, I I will say I saw it. I was shocked. I think most of the hockey world was. And just seeing that many picks. Also, Cal Foot. I mean, I know he probably hasn't lived up to the expectations of a first-round pick by Tampa. But still, a, a serviceable defenseman. But what Breeze Boss said, and I'll read this as well as I can. At the end of the day, I know there's a perceived value of those picks but we have a really good idea of what the actual value of those picks are. Individually, you can go, what's the first round pick worth? What's the second round pick worth? And so forth and so on. When we look at what's worth to us, based on the odds of those picks turning into good NHL players down the road, I'd rather have the good player right now for this season and next and help this group win right now because I know what the odds are of those picks turning into players. I also know what the odds are of those picks turning into players that can help us win while we have this group of players right now in their prime, ready to go for another long run. The odds of that are zero. None of those picks were going to help. None of the players we were going to draft with those picks are going to help us win this year, or next, or probably the year after that. So when you put it into that context and you frame it that way, it ends up being a pretty easy decision, actually. And I completely understand what he's saying, and I think fan bases, in terms of teams that are going for it, respect it as well, because... You can look at like the future and what you're giving up and what possibly could happen with all these picks. And then you look at, we got two Stanley Cups, we went to another final, and who knows how much longer we have. And why not just completely be willing to sacrifice the future to just try to get another one? And as a fan, if I'm a fan, I'm looking at like, yes, I, I really don't care. And I understand that this could be in five, six years, a team that's really struggling in bottom of the barrel. But look at what we have the chance to do again this year. So when I look at like, fifth round picks, even the first round pick, I'm trying to win another Stanley Cup. And now, not only do we add a guy like Janot who's physical, he can fight, not that that matters a ton in the playoffs, but it does in a sense. I know that this guy is going to make a difference. And the biggest thing, and I think the biggest thing that people have been saying in terms of defending Tampa is the fact that they know what to do with these guys. They know what to do with Coleman. They know what to do with Barkley Goudreau. They know how to get Nick Paul into the lineup making a difference. So they have this proven track record of bringing over third-line grinders who can fight and play physical and be playoff-type players, and they know how to get them in their lineup playing that type of system and playing that type of hockey. So I, I know the, the return looks insane and what they gave up. Great job by David Poyle who we'll get into is now actually yes. retiring July 1st. But great job by him getting Nashville a bunch of picks and in and, and, and a sense of trying to rebuild this whole thing. But good job by Tampa because what the fuck else? Why would you wait for anything else? You have a chance to do it again, so let's just deal with the future when the future comes and let's get a player that we know can help us win playoff games. Ve- Vegas Oz has the top six teams in the league as those top six teams in the Eastern Conference. You look at this Tampa Bay lineup right now and they can win another Stanley Cup. And and you you know you talk about that physicality that that is one thing that they'll have the edge on against going against Toronto and one thing I was concerned about for Toronto even going into playoffs the way they're built now the Lafferty pickups going to help with that we know the Achari is, is going to help with that the reason why you know we still don't know where O'Reilly's going to end up but he's also not going to be intimidated by that type of physicality but if you look at that bottom six. And everybody's saying Patty Maroon and, and Corey Perry don't scare me. They're a little slow. You don't think those guys know how to contribute their fucking 10 minutes? Are you guys in out of your playoffs, fucking mind? Too. Look at the... I already mentioned the, the third line in Colton, Paul, and Janot. They got Maroon, Maroon, Belmar, and Corey Perry as their fourth line. That's going to be a very difficult bottom six for the Maple Leafs to handle. And I would say up front, based on playoff experience and championship pedigree, those are two very evenly matched lineups right now advantage going to Tampa and that still confident in my Leafs because I think they're going to be hungrier but this is a Stanley Cup lineup in in Tampa Bay and you, and you, we've already mentioned those two those two deals the Coleman one he was making two million bucks when he came over he still had another year left on that deal and that's why they overpaid for him same with Hagel where he was making 1.5 each year which is obviously a bargain he's set to get paid this offseason 
And with the Geno situation, he's restricted. Getting this guy, he might sign a, a bridge deal. I'm hearing that they're trying to lock him into a Nick Paul type deal where they give him length and they get a nice little bargain. So now all of a sudden you've solidified a, a perfect uh, middle six guy where I think that he's the type of guy who could bump up to the second line once the offense starts going. So you, you have to have guys in a hard cap era that are making that middle money who are contributing not just on the score sheet. But you talked about a guy who's willing to fight, a guy who's heavy on the forecheck, uh, a good net front presence, all the other little intangibles. Tanner Janot is a good fucking hockey player, and this is an unreal trade. And I give each team an A plus for the haul that that Nashville got back, and the one guy that they needed to get in the lineup for the Tampa Bay Lightning. Good stuff, Biz. <clears throat> By the way, Janot wasn't even drafted, so they were able to turn an undrafted guy into all those picks. So impressive work for Poyle. We'll get we'll get to him in a second. Uh, Tampa Bay's first pick in the next draft isn't until the sixth round. They don't have a first or a second next year, and they don't have a first in 25. So, you know, they're mortgaging it for the fucking championships now, and that's that's what it's all about, I suppose. Uh, let's see, the Preds also lost Ryan Johansson for the rest of the season. He got cut by a skate, required surgery, but I, he had those cut-resistant resistant socks on, and they said it would have been a lot worse if he didn't have them on. So obviously, those things are incredible, and I I think the the one everyone seems to think of often is is Eric Carlson when Matt Cook got him. I don't think he had him on then, and those have been I would say biz when we were playing they were kind of coming around, but now I would think most guys wear them, and and what a godsend they can be because that, that's it's truly like it's horrific to think what could happen with the skate blade, and you know we saw what Evander Kane went through this year, but. Thank God he had it on because if he's still out with surgery and, and, and was wearing them, who knows what could have happened if he hadn't. So a pretty amazing invention. I think it's Kevlar that's used and the socks are still light enough that guys don't mind wearing them just to add that extra protection. Yeah, Preds already had a tough challenge trying to get in the playoffs. It's got to get a lot tougher with no Johansson. Guys, before we go any further, I want to talk to you about our Battle of the Badge merch line. That is right. We have teamed up with Barstool Sports and released a merch line to support the Battle of the Badge hockey game. That is between the NYPD and FDNY on April 15th at the UBS Arena on Long Island. We are not only proud to be broadcasting this hockey game, we are also proud to support this merch line. 100% of net proceeds goes directly to the Hockey Heroes Fund. Let me repeat that. 100% of net proceeds goes directly to the Hockey Heroes Fund. This fund will be split evenly between the NYPD and FDNY, and you could check that out at store.barstoolsports.com, store.barstoolsports.com. Now back to the show. The other big news, like we just said, uh, David Poyle, he's going to retire after 26 years as the general manager down in Music City, the only general manager that the Preds have ever had. Uh, Let's see, 73 years old. Not really a surprise that he's going to retire. He's actually going to hang on with the team, be a consultant. I was surprised by the replacement. Barry Trotz is going to take over officially in June, but he's working for the team now. He's going to be an advisor as they, you know, do the transition, whatever. Were you a little surprised with that? You know, Trotz went to the G, to the uh, to GM role instead of going back behind the bench. Yeah, I was, um, but it kind of makes sense now that maybe he was turning down coaching options, knowing that this was probably going to happen. I'm sure he's close enough with David Poyle where he said, "Listen, I want you to be my successor," and. And, and and Trotz then has to think about, all right, do I want to coach again? I think being a GM is, is a better move, especially as you get older. You're not traveling as much. It's a little easier on the body, on the mind maybe. But to now know what, what David Poyle accomplished as the GM of the Predators, and I know there was never a Stanley Cup, but they made that special run uh, when the Penguins got him. And just to know that he was there from the beginning and to see what that team has turned into in terms of an entire market and a fan base and how fun it is to go to a game – it's a pretty special accomplishment. And I know he was around the league for a long time before he was in Nashville, and he did a bunch of great things. But to actually see what he built there, and it was him and, and a lot of other people, including Barry Trotz and, and, and other people that work for the organization that, that maybe we don't know their names. But when you look at David Poyle, the drafting he did, to build a team from basically nothing with a fan base that didn't know a ton about hockey into this rabid group of fans that sell out each game that have this amazing atmosphere that people want to travel to and be a part of and witness a game in Nashville it's been such a great run and I think for a team that was always kind of I'm not going to say cash strap but it wasn't one of the big spenders before the cap and then since the cap to see the drafting that they've had Shea Weber Ryan Suter Dan Hamheis all these defensemen that they've developed it's been one of their signature calling cards in terms of drafting defensemen 
And then just to, to that one run was special. I mean, Pittsburgh got the best of them, but it was a hell of a series. And I think that when you look back on David Poyle's career, it's nothing but an enormous success. So congrats to him on a hell of a run. And I know he'll be sticking around for this draft and then kind of <laughs> hang him up and be just on the sidelines a little bit. Barry Trotz will probably be great at that job. You know he's probably comfortable with Nashville. That was probably the biggest thing. If I'm going to end up being able to be GM of this team, I don't need to coach again. It's probably went through his mind. So it's an exciting time for Nashville fans because you're losing an all-time great GM, but you're getting yeah. a guy who knows the area, who knows the team, and knows the fan base, and I think it'll be awesome. It is tough, it is tough though, going to, to become a GM. It's so much different than coaching. There's so many different factors with the AHL team and all the prospects and all the prospect pools you're going through in the draft. So it'll be probably difficult, but he's probably been learning on the fly as his career's gone on, and now Poyle will be able to help him take over. Um, just for great breakdown. As far as Poyle, um, you'd be hard-pressed to find a more respected, nicer man in the entire game of hockey. Uh, an incredible, incredible run as far as GM of that organization. I want to say right now, Outside of Pittsburgh, they have the longest streak of making playoffs, most consecutive seasons making the playoffs. So the fact in that small market, the amount of sustained relevancy he could take them to with with being crafty about all these little moves and trades that he's been making, um, you know, it, it, it just speaks to, to the success that he's had. You said that you were a little shocked about Barry Trott uh, joining him. Maybe shocked that he, he's back there doing it, uh, but... I'm not shocked that he wanted to be a GM. From my understanding, that was, I know there was talked about that his father w was was going through illness and he wanted to be closer to his family. But from also part of my understanding from other people was he was hoping at one point that he was going to be able to replace Lou. And when that was no longer clear and the fact that Lou maybe wants to stay around a little bit longer or pass the throne off to somebody more likely of his choosing, that that's where things started fizzling out. So now he ends up in this role in which he wanted. Now it makes more sense of the fact that he's back with Poyle, a guy who he he coached for for many, many years. And considering Poyle is going to still stay on as a consultant, it's almost like they're going to have this tag team effort and work together like they did in the past to have that success once again. I mean, some people say, well, they, they didn't win it. Well, I tell you what, man, for being a small market like that and for for – having the achievements that they've had I'd say it's uh, pretty fucking successful so happy that he's there I think it, it makes a lot of sense I'm sure those fans he's be he's beloved there for what he trots did for the community for them to bring him back in I bet you despite maybe the negativity surrounding this season and how they're not going to probably make playoffs I'd say it's a pretty nice bonus and I they also, can give um, a proper send off to Poyle and, and according you know Jeff Merrick said on, on Hockey Night in Canada besides Saros Roman Yossi and Philippe Forsberg, everyone else is basically on the table in Nashville. So as an Oilers fan, I'm hoping somehow they can get Ekholm out of there. The only question is, I mentioned on Twitter, what the hell do you have to give up? Because he just he just got that return for Tanner Janot. Who knows what the fuck he would <laughs> get for from Matthias Ekholm. Maybe somebody wrote me on Twitter, he'd have to send the West Edmonton Mall. <laughs> <laughs> Aldo, Aldo. Um, of course, we got six Aldos. We got four four Harveys, a gun shooting and, range, and, and a swimming pool, yeah, and and uh, Tim Hortons rights all throughout <laughs> Edmonton. Me and G, of course, we went to the, that Stanley Cup 2017. Was that probably the first ever uh, Chicklets Roadie? Me and you, right? I would imagine G. We didn't we didn't do anything. Was correct. That, right? We funded it ourselves as well. Yeah, self funded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We picked up the tab ourselves. Well, we did have a hookup uh, on the ticket end, so that was that was not the problem at all. But I slept yeah. on the floor of your hotel room. We stayed in a like a two hundred dollar a night hotel room in Nashville, like the cheapest hotel we could find. I slept face first on the floor every night. So hey. um, I actually have the stat here. So Pittsburgh leads the way with consecutive playoff appearances with sixteen in a row right now, which is also in jeopardy. And then Nashville's right below them with eight straight. So this will be the first time in, uh, in in a while that they don't end up crashed. But uh, they ended so up Crosby's playing the Coyotes. Never missed. He missed his first year. I, okay, I want to say yep. his first was year was team. a probably old, should remember old, that. <laughs> the only year you are just dragging him down. <laughs> um, so I got a chance to watch Nashville the other night, and and despite all this news surrounding the team, they they still play their bags off. And at home did look really good. They play a very physical game. And, and one kid I was very happy for was that Cody Glass. 
he his game's starting to it's starting to turn around. He's starting to get really adapted to the NHL at speed and his creativity out there. He had a no look backhand pass over to Dutchie and then had a beauty on the power play to really put things away in the third period. So that was a guy who who dealt with a lot of injuries in, in the start of his NHL career. So I'm hoping this change of scenery and the more ice time and, and the more confidence that comes, this kid uh, turns out exactly where they expected he would be. Uh, Biz, you know who has the record for uh, most consecutive years in the playoffs? I do. I would assume that Detroit Red Wings at 23 years? Nope. Uh, Wait, just, just, I'll give you a clue. Um the colors of the team are represented by the flag behind RA. The Boston Bruins at the Boston. 20, it was like 30 years or something, wasn't it? 29, 29 straight years. years yeah. And they didn't win a cup in yeah, all that time. there were six fucking teams in the league for fuck's no, sake. No, no, this was like in the no. 80s and 90s and early 2000s, I think. Yeah, yeah, the streak ended, I want to say, 96, 97, right around there. Yeah, 29 years. Well, that perfect segue. Uh, Don Tweeney, say what you will about him, but he put his balls on the table. They're getting ready for the cup run. He picked up Dmitry Orlov and uh, Garnet Hathaway from the uh, Capitals. A three-way deal involving Washington and Minnesota. Uh, the Caps got Craig Smith. He's uh, going to be a UFA this summer. And they got Boston's first-round pick in 23. They're third in 24. And they're second in 25. They're also going to retain half of Orlov's salary. Minnesota's going to take a quarter of that salary, too. And for uh, their troubles, they're going to get a fifth-rounder from Boston. They also potted with their sixth round pick from 2017, Andres Svetlakov. Yeah, Svetlakov. His rights went to Boston. Uh, Orlov and Hathaway are both going to be unrestricted this summer. But with the best team in the league, just got better, and not by a little bit either. These are two huge additions. Uh, what's your take on it, buddy? I I, I love this trade. I I think it was an absolute game breaker. And for somebody who's been very hard on on Don Sweeney in terms of his drafting. You got to pump his tires when it comes to his trades because this guy has brought in Lindholm now. He's brought in Orlov. He got Taylor Hall in the mix. There's all these different things he's done to add to his current team. So maybe in terms of the future in drafting, he hasn't been great. But in adding to his team, he's been top of the list GM because this trade was a... When I look at the Bruins, it's like, all right, McAvoy is one of the best defensemen in the league. If it, you know, he's not. He, I think it's Makar, and then like I'll I'll talk about McAvoy right after that. I don't, I don't under, I don't understand people who don't realize how good he is. He fucking runs people over. So McAvoy's right there. Then you got Lindholm, who's having a ridiculous season, and then now you're gonna have Orlov. So you're gonna have Orlov, Lindholm, or McAvoy at the on the ice every single shift. I mean, that is something else because you look at the chances that the Bruins have to win the Stanley Cup this year. And Hathaway also, I mean, I love that because he's a perfect Bruin. He's going to fit into the third and fourth line. He's a motherfucker to play against. He's from Maine, so he mentioned that it was always a dream to play for the Bruins. Really cool story for him. He played at Brown, which is in Providence, so it's like... It all comes full circle, and he gets to be a member of the Boston Bruins. He's going to make a big difference. They get rid of the Craig Smith contract, who never really fell into the plan this year. I don't think he played great, and maybe Montgomery wasn't a huge fan of his game. So he's out the door. Hathaway comes in, more of a Bruin-type player, more of a playoff-type player. But the Orloff move is what really solidifies that team because now to just mention the fact that they will never have a guy on the ice on D that isn't Orlov, McAvoy, or Lindholm, and you're thinking how special this team is. Now, I saw right off the bat... He was playing the right side with Forbert, and Clifton got scratched, which was kind of surprising. I actually pictured Orlov on the left and Clifton on the right of that 5-6, and you can't even consider it the 5-6 because of how good Orlov is. And I think that now, you know, they say he can play on the right side, but I think what's going to happen is you're going to see mixtures and, and different pairings kind of given a shot throughout the rest of the regular season to really see where they want to be game one of the first round. But Orlov is an awesome player. The guy goes back, he gets the puck, he makes great first outlet passes. He's really better offensively than his numbers show this year. And just the fact that he could skate so well, it's just a difference. It's a difference maker on the back end for a team who already had a strong one. But the thing is, with the Bruins addressing what they really needed to address and one more defender and one bottom six guy, they did a hell of a job. So now you get the best team in the league. And the thing that blows me away at the, oh, at the Bruins is I go to the standings, I'll check the stats. The goal differential, like all these good teams are plus 45, plus 46. They're plus 94. I mean, this team is something else. And then to, just to get this guy on D and that honey badger up front, it was a hell of a move for the Bruins. I, I couldn't agree. The only thing I would say, one of the strongest D course I think we've seen in recent memory. The, fa the fact that you're, you're, if the, the flip-flop might be uh, Clifton or Forbert out of the lineup, like, fuck it, it 
some of those guys, some, either one of those might be top four in some teams who are making playoffs deep air. And and the, the reason why maybe I lean more towards Forbert is I like him on the penalty kill. I, he's he, he sacrifices his body. He's meat and potatoes. He's he's a he's a utility guy, and that's where he specializes in. So you seem to have a lot of a uh, puck moving uh, all around defenseman. Where maybe you just need that guy who's just who's just there to be meat and potatoes off the glass and out. So uh, just a, a a wagon of a lineup. I, I don't know if we mentioned the goalie goal yet. This has been a magical season for them. Anything less than the Eastern Conference Finals would be a disappointment. Oh, absolutely. And well, seeing as you brought the goalie goal up, yeah, Saturday in Vancouver, Linus Elmark scored the first goalie goal in Bruins history. I uh, also got the puck line cover. I love how he went by the bench, did a little flyby with all that the glove awesome. taps. That, that was good stuff. And then, you know, he does the post-game hug with Swayman every every game. And then that was like the all-time, jumped up in his arms. It was like two lovers haven't seen each other in 20 years, that hug. Uh, good shit. Well, gee, let's get your take on it. You're another Bruins fan. What's your take on the trade, buddy? I mean, I think Biz just said it. They're a team of destiny. Given their forwards, does your guys do? The, do their bottom six scare you at all? You, Not you think at all. Adding Hathaway is enough. You're okay with? Uh, is it AJ Greer? Could yeah, be the, Frederick the, the guy? Greer Hathaway. That no is shit. meat no and shit. potatoes. Just how you need it for a playoff run, Biz. I like Coyle penciled in as that third line center. I just wasn't sure how you guys felt about the rest of the guys. Yeah. Well, you got Coyle, Coyle the third and round. you have Taylor Hall in the third line as well. I mean, that's that might be the best third line in all of hockey. Okay. All right. You heard it here first. You guys are the Boston guys. Yeah. Well, we got one more note. You might as well get to it, Biz, if you brought the goal up. Uh, Brad Marchand, he's been a, 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 an absolute menace on social media between Instagram and Twitter. Uh, he got fined $5,000 uh, for a, what they call it, a dangerous trip all of a York strand, right? You, I, what do you want to call it, a slew or whatever the, the league called it, a dangerous trip, $5,000 fine, bringing his total forfeited salary up to $1,424,000, oh. yeah, $1,424,568,000 and 33 cents. Oh, eight, eight, all right, you could, that was you an could amazing have rounded up, buddy. You just hey, could have, you could I think have you just up. listed a billion dollars the way you said that. <laughs> One million. Yeah, call 1.4 mil. <laughs> Eight sussies, six fines, 28 games lost. That's a lot of pocket tickets. Uh, so on S- Sunday night, he tweeted, back on Cameo, we all know why. He was like chirping the, they were talking about maybe an all-star game in like Edmonton or Seattle. He's like, LOL, can't wait to see how many guys boycott that game. And then people started chirping him. He's like, well, it's true. And he's like, not like you'll be making it anyways. And guy's <laughs> like, I-, I hope it's not one of those places. Just going back and forth with all the fans and shit. He's like, let's put it this way. No one's taking less to stay there talking about Edmonton. Just the absolute chirp fest for him, but that's my shun. Yeah, I'm glad RA is not a capologist, but as far as Marshall is <laughs> concerned, Cameo, the app where you can get these uh, these personalized messages, what is he charging per Cameo? Can you dig that up for us, Grinelli? I wouldn't mind, uh, mind purchasing one for the podcast. It'd be fun to see if we can get uh, him introducing one of our episodes or something. Oh, oh, oh. What's it cost? A personalized video will cost $200 from Brad Marshall. <laughs> <laughs> that is expensive, Brad. Well, he only needs he only paying. he only needs twenty five of them to get that five grand back. So they'll probably be locked up, and then he'll be right off cameo in two days. <laughs> Entertaining on and off the ice, uh, Biz. Uh, one of your teams is up next. A few minutes ago, the Leafs made a big deal to shore up their defense. Uh, they acquired a defenseman, Jake McCabe, forward Sam Lafferty, a fifth round pick in twenty four, and a fifth round pick in twenty five from the Blackhawks. Uh, in return, the Hawks got uh, forward Joey Anderson, forward Pavel Gogolev, and a top 10 protected first round pick in 25, and a second round pick in 26. Uh, the Leafs need more than this biz. Like, what else do they got to do here? Is Jake McCabe, what's your take on it here, buddy? So his name kept popping up quite a bit. Uh, it's really hard to to um, evaluate. Evaluate? Is that how you say it? Yeah, evaluate uh, a defenseman who's on a team that is so bad because you're spending so much time in your defensive zone. The last time I got to watch him play was uh, exa- uh, was actually against the Leafs, where right off the opening faceoff, he ended up toe-picking and Nylander went down and scored. So uh, I don't know if he was, I, I don't know if it was an inside job trying to get the, <laughs> the Leafs home ice advantage in the first round. Maybe he had a, a little meeting with Dubas in the hallway, say, hey, help us out here. We'll fucking pick you up at the deadline. We'll go on a run, buddy. Uh, but uh, I, think he's, I think he's just a good, solid defenseman. He plays physical. Um, I don't think he's going to wow you with this play, but with the mu- Muzzin going down with his injury and him announcing that he's going to be out for the season, I think that they had to go out and just do something 
So just to have a, a bigger guy back there who can play against heavy bodies like Tampa Bay, like Boston if they have to, well, they went out and got it. Um, Lafferty, who ended up starting out in Pittsburgh, just seems like an up-and-down-the-wing type player who plays with a physical edge. Fast, uh, Another too. thing, too, yeah, you just, like I said, it's it's hard to see what these guys are made of when they're playing on a team that's basically AHL caliber. So coming over, I'm interested to see how their first couple games go. I don't exactly know where they slot in, but uh, we'll see. And I, I trust Dubas's move in, in a sense where he feels that they can fill in holes that they are missing right now. I think Dubas understands and knows that he's probably gone if they don't get out of the first round. It's like, what are we waiting for here? We got to do it this year or, or, or bust. And I like their move so far. I really do. I, I, I think we already talked about O'Reilly and, and Achari and, and now to get that other forward, bottom six guy who can play with pace the way the Maple Leafs do, I just feel real bad for, for Jake Muzzin. Um, you know, he's out for the year. It's, it's a scary injury that he's dealing with. And, you know, he means a lot to that team. So you just feel for a guy who, who although he's won the Stanley Cups and had this amazing career, it just sucks to see that he's going to be out this year with injury and who knows the future. But good job by Dubas to get a defenseman who's similar in, in, in stature and, and skill level, physicality. So good moves by good moves by Toronto. I don't know if they'll have anything anything more to do leading up to Friday. One other tree we had mentioned it. The Habs and Stars exchanged a pair of Russian forwards. Uh, Dallas sent Denis uh, Gurionov to Montreal. Got back Evgeny Dadunov. Uh, Dadunov's thirty three years old. He's got eighteen points in fifty games. He'll, he'll be unrestricted this summer. Uh, Gur- Gurionov's twenty five. He's got nine points in forty three games. He'll be an RFA this summer. Uh, if there's anything on this, just two guys who need to change the scenery. Basically, this Dadunov. He got screwed over last year with yep. the fake move over to Anaheim. Uh, he had a great season. He's a guy who, who's, I, I guess you could kind of move him up and down the lineup. With the lack of offense that Dallas has had lately, I hope that he moves over there and, and is able to find his rhythm. And I think that he could be a massive, massive add. I, I, I think that's a sneaky, sneaky pickup. It's it's kind of sad that we're talking about the biggest moves in the West being Nino Niederreiter, uh, Barbashev, and and right now Dadnov. But those are the moves that I think that you're going to have to make, and, and not much in the West in order to really compete with it. What else is going on? But I could see that being like a Nemestikov a few a few years ago, where it's the sneakiest move of the deadline based I, on I, what you had to give away to get him. As far as Garyanov, he hadn't done fuck all this year. He was as useless as Kapanen was in uh, in Pittsburgh. Which is kind of crazy because he's fast as shit. He was a high pick, and there was times he was unreal. So maybe going to Montreal in terms of getting more ice time, he could kind of pop off. I think that's the the thought in, in terms of Kent Hughes and thinking that there's still like untapped potential there. But um, I did want to mention the Niederreiter move. We, we kind of skipped by it quick. Winnipeg... Who, who has had the sneakiest, quietest, great season of any team in the league. I think they're 4-7 and seven in their last 11 games. In eight of those games, they've scored two or less. So they did have to do something. Niederreiter should help. It was a quiet move, but at least it's a move Winnipeg kind of realizes they're hitting the skids a little bit and things are getting a little bit scary for them. So it is weird in the West right now, though. We need Edmonton to do something. We really do. Yeah, they better do something before Friday. But, boys, we've been buzzing along. I think we should probably send it over to Dylan Strong right about now. You you'll agree? Let's do it. Another Perfect. team in the Eastern playoff race. Great dude. Played in Arizona. I'm happy that he moved on to Chicago and now Washington and is having success. And, boys, he got fucking paid just like his brother. Chicklets fans, major announcement. Pizza Hut is bringing back the New Yorker, and even more important news, they are coming on as a major sponsor for the FDNY NYPD hockey game going on at UBS Arena on Long Island, April 15th. Do not miss it. On top of that, you know what Pizza Hut's doing? They're going to be handing out those wonderful pies all across the fans and the stands. That's what they're going to do. So not only are they supporting an incredible cause, them coming on board and delivering pies out to the fans makes it 10 times better. So we'll see you at the game. And once again, the New Yorker is back and we can't thank Pizza Hut enough. Watch out! All right, enjoy Dylan Strom. All right, we'd like to welcome our next guest to the show. He was taken third overall at the 2015 draft by the Arizona Coyotes. He then went pro after four years of putting up monster numbers for the Erie Otters of the OHL. After a few years in Chicago, he signed with Washington, where he's already signed a five-year extension. Thanks so much for joining us once again on the Spit and Chickens podcast, Dylan Strom. 
How's it going, man? Pretty good, boys. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. It's been yeah. a long time. Mem Cup MVP. You won the scoring title over McDavid and Marner, just dropping your nuts on their forehead. Fucking A, buddy. What a junior career you had. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Those, those are the good days, I guess they call them. <laughs> are you in a are you in a cell right now? I'm in my hotel room. I just I didn't have time to make my bed, so I didn't want to, you know, show the dirty bed. Okay. Once you get back into a wild card spot, they're gonna go back to the four seasons or what? We got we got some work to do to catch up to that, but hopefully we can get back in there. It's been a bit of a grind as of late, but boys are working for it, so lost a tough one yesterday to Buffalo. They're they're a good young team, so they uh they, they got the best of us for sure. Yeah, we just had Tage Thompson on. Actually, where you're you're playing second fiddle right now. <laughs> we usually go to the winners and then the, and then the losers. <laughs> he dusted me on a few draws, and he got I think he had one or two goals. I don't know. He was he's having a year. He's a hell of a player. That guy. You just mentioned uh, Connor McDavid at juniors. Was he head and shoulders above everybody, even at 15, 16 years old, or kind of yeah, on the same level? Oh, I mean, you know, I don't know. That's yeah, why I'm I mean, asking. <laughs> no, and he was like by far like. I've told the story a few times. Like he, he just did these things in practice that you you couldn't even like believe. Like he was the same age, we're the same age, and it's like how can this guy be so much better than at that time? You know, guys that were four and five years older because he was the year younger. And I mean, like, I don't think anyone's surprised. Anyone that watched him in junior isn't surprised at what he's doing now. Um, you know, you hear those like generational that word thrown around a lot, but he obviously is. And and you know the stuff he's doing in the NHL, it's like. Did you guys see that spinorama the other day, like at, at at the blue line? Like, if that gets picked off, like for like ninety nine percent of other players, that's a that's a two on zero the other way. But he just dipsy doodles around through the middle and just you know makes these plays happen out of nowhere. And he's been doing that for for a long time. It's you know I'm gonna hold that uh, that scoring title over over everyone's head for for a long time, and I do. Was he on the juice? <laughs> no. You think you think he was juicing at that age? No. No. All right, just wondering. I'm just wondering. He was a freak in junior. I just figured to ask you. Thought maybe he'd be the type of teammate to shove needles in his ass. Where, what do you got? Well, I was going to say, first off, congrats, buddy, on the deal you signed because I know yep. I think it's your seventh year pro. Um, kind of a tough go in Arizona for everyone the, the the past long while, it seems like. And then you get to Chicago. But then this year, it seems like you've really kind of found your stride in terms of like being where you want to be, being a part of a team that, that knows what you can do. So it had to be a relief to get a nice contract too in terms of like grinding throughout all these years to find yourself as a player and on the right team, right? Yeah, for sure. I appreciate the the kind words, but like I've, you know, it's been, not everyone's path is the same way to get to the NHL. Mine certainly wasn't, you know, being a high pick, especially with the guys that were drafted around me. Um, you know, you go through, you go through stretches where you're like, you know, obviously people are throwing around the word, the, the bus label all the time and um, you know, it's not easy to hear all the time. So you just try to, you know, put it in the back of your mind and, and not worry about it too much. And then, you know, like I said, everyone has a different path. And once I got traded to Chicago, I feel like it really turned around for me and, and they kind of just believed in me and gave me a, a really good chance to play with some really good players. And then, um, you know, the team obviously didn't do as well as, as they would have hoped. And, you know, we made some trades last year at the beginning and everyone expected us to be a playoff team. And then starting off the season, like, oh, and 11, just everything kind of just fell apart after that and then the um you know like the sexual assault scandal and there was just so much going on with our team the gm got fired and then um coach got fired and and just a bunch of stuff going on and then um you know they kind of just decided on on the fly that they were going to do a full-on rebuild when when kyle became the gm and then um i kind of knew after that kind of that moment i feel like i, I wasn't going to be back there but you know i had some good success there and some good some good numbers and played with some unbelievable players and then coming to washington i was you know, going to a new team, you never really know what to expect, especially an old team with so many veterans and, and, and legends on the team and, and guys that, you know, they expect, you know, a, a lot of um, anyone they bring in. And obviously Backstrom was out, so it was kind of the good fit at the beginning of the year. Um, got to play with Ovi, um, you know, got to play with some really good players. I was playing on the power play every single night and, and yeah, it kind of just clicked and the team was doing well and we were in a playoff spot and, you know, the timing was just right. And, you know, when they offered me a contract, of, of course, with, with everything that's gone on, I was going to I was gonna jump all over that. I hate to revisit it and go back, but just, you know, the fact that you weren't there when everything originally happened and to be part of Chicago last season and through everything that was happening media-wise, it, I don't think we've talked to anyone from Chicago since. It just obviously sucked the complete life out of the locker room. And you're answering questions. Like, yeah, like you came to the rink every day not not knowing like, you know, what was going to come out that day or, or, or who was going to be gone or, or what the news was. I mean, obviously it was a, a terrible situation to, you know, for everyone involved and, you know, especially for, for Kyle Beach. Like, I mean, to have to, have to go through that, I mean, you know, you, you don't even want to think about, you know, that that type of thing. So, um, 
yeah, but you're coming to the rink and like no one knew what was going to happen. And, and there was, you know, you know, there was people being asked questions. There was like the, the GM being asked questions. The owners were being asked questions. And then, you know, you don't really hear too much about it. Like, everything that went on or what was going to happen so you're kind of just at the mercy of you know whatever the media says or whatever you know whatever you hear pretty much so i'm going to go back to the trade when you, when you got traded to chicago were you bummed out that arizona kind of got rid of you so quick were you happy with the change of scenery a little bit of both i mean i i think i i definitely didn't play like up to my up to my capability there i don't i, I don't want to say i didn't get a, a great shot I, I didn't play a lot of minutes and i wasn't really on the power play there was it was but you know, there's you can make excuses for everything. I think I, I didn't play that well there, and and I think it was a, a good change of scenery for both. Obviously, you see how well Schmaltz is doing there, and you know, I think the trade worked out for both teams. I'd say it. I think you know they kind of wanted to you know to get a, a new piece and, and see how it worked, and then um, you know Chicago was kind of doing the same thing. So um, I think it worked out for both. I was I was definitely happy to to have a little change of scenery, but you know, being so young, I had only played 48 games when I got traded, so I was like still trying to find my way. I remember the one big thing that happened to me was I never got a housing letter in Arizona. So I was like up there for like four or five months, you know, throughout the, the couple of years. And I was living in a hotel pretty much the whole time. I eventually moved in with, uh, with Chikrin, um, to Domi's house and, and I still hadn't had a housing letter. So it, it's just one of those things that sticks in the back of your mind that, you know, are you going to be there for a long time? Are you going to stick there? Um, things like that. And then I remember I got traded to Chicago and, 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 uh, the team services guy, Tony Omen, he went to me like the first day I got there, he's like, yeah just go look for a condo and, and let us know what you find. We'll get you a hotel until then. And I was like, really? Like <laughs> I can get a housing letter. Are, are, you, are you sure? And he's like, yeah, Stan told me, uh, Stan told me that, that, uh, to go find a house. So it was like, kind of like right, right off the bat, it, it felt like, you know, they really wanted me. And, and it's a small thing, obviously, but as a young guy, you know, a housing letter means a lot. It means that you're going to be up there for, for the year. And it means that, you know, you're going to stay there and play. And you saw that would happened with that video with Gunther, like, like when he got the, the call, the, the was told by Arizona that he's going to stay there and stuff. And it's just like, you want to do that and it helps your confidence and you know as little as it may be i think it's 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 a big thing and um so when i got to chicago kind of just started off on the right foot and then my first game i was playing with the breakhead and chain and we played against vegas and you know had one and one and was pretty fired up about it so um no i hadn't even had a two-point game i don't think in my career to that point what's cool is like people all sometimes don't realize how much off ice stuff affects on ice play so you're telling us, boom, you're told right away you're going to be here, get a place, and then you're like a point-per-game player that year. Like, there's no chance it didn't have one to do with the other, right? Yeah. No, I think it's it's exactly that. Um, you know, I think it's like you get told that and and you just – it just kind of, you know, gets you going. And, it, like, they're like, oh, you, oh, they want you. So um, that was definitely good to hear, and, and I was I was super excited and, and found a place right away. And, and uh, you, know, it, you know, the rest is history, I guess. You talk about that draft. A lot of people kind of say like the 03 draft's the best of all time. I, I think if you look to 2015, like it's pretty much becoming like the same type thing. I know Boston had a little bit of, of a hiccup with three in a row in the middle, but did you know go, kind of going into your draft year and, and right around 17, 18, 19, like how stacked that draft was and how many good players are going to end up being NHL stars from, from that first round? I don't think... Uh... You really realize at the time because those are the th- those are the guys that you've like kind of grown up with and, and played with like throughout throughout your whole life. So you know they're good players, but you never know how the how the draft is going to turn out. I think if you if you look at like the first round, um, you know there's some there's some really really good players. And even the second round, like Aho was a second rounder. Yeah, you know maybe I'm a bit biased, but I think yeah it was it was maybe it, it, it rivals the 2003 draft for sure. I think um maybe like Shabbat, Kyle Connor, um, Timo Meyer, Rantanen. Like the list kind of goes on. Provorov, like there's these guys that are making you know good money and, and uh, you know obviously doing really well for for teams and guys that have won Stanley Cups and and that are a big part and and obviously Boston has those three picks in a row and I mean they they got the Brusque and the other two um, are kind of up and down in the NHL um, but you know Boston made it made a Stanley Cup final you know the, the most recent out of out of anyone that you know kind of got drafted in that area so I think you know when they got a guy like DeBrusque, um no, he's obviously huge for their team, and you see what he's doing now. He's just having a great year again. It's true. You, I'm looking at the second round. It's like Christian Fisher, Sebastian Ajo, Brandon Carlo. Uh, there's so Daniel Sprong. I mean, who's had a great year. Rupe Hints. You're right. Rasmus Anderson. That was. I didn't even realize how good the second one was. Vince Dunn, Siegenthaler. It's pretty cool. Well, I was just going to say that the trade over to Chicago. Did it have a lot to do with the fact that you'd played with the DeBrinket uh, in in uh, in junior? When you got there, was that something they said that you could they could hopefully like reignite that chemistry that you had playing with them in Erie? Yeah, I think so. I think it, I think it helped for sure. Um, you know, we were we were a pretty good uh, pretty good duo in junior there for the last for a couple of years, and and we had a lot of success. And um, you know, then when I didn't have success in Arizona, I think Chicago kind of saw an opportunity, and 
Debrinket had 28 goals as a rookie um, with like three hat tricks, I think. And and um, you know they knew what what he was what he was capable of. And I think they could only they thought that it was gonna you know boost boost his uh, you know goal scoring and, and his play. And and I think that together it worked really well. And then obviously when you throw a guy like like Kane on the other side, I mean definitely not just a throw-in type of guy but um you know we we had instant instant chemistry and connection and and uh you know actually that first year it was actually me to break and dominic cahoon i don't know if you remember that name he was he was uh in the nhl for a while and we had we were playing on the third line so we were getting great matchups um we had a pretty good team and it was just we were playing on the power play together and you know there was uh, a lot of chemistry and i i do think that was a big reason why they traded for me they never like said that to me in in, in person but um no, I think the the connection there with what we did in junior together uh, kind of translated to to Chicago. Was Kane what you would have expected him to be when you got there, just personality wise, the way that he handled himself? He seems like he's a pretty quiet guy, just puts around, minds his own business. Is he a funny bastard? Is he throwing chirps underneath his breath breath and shit? I think he's a type of guy that um, you know once once he kind of opens up and once you're there for a while, I think yeah, he he definitely throws the chirps. He wasn't what I was expecting at all. Um, you know. As like a you know twenty year old, you just hear about Patty Kane and you hear like all the all these stories and, and everything like that. And um, you know he won three cups. Uh, he's won a Conn Smythe. He won a uh, you know Rocky Richard. He won. I think he's won pretty much everything there is to win. Um, but he's a really really down to earth guy. Like he, um, you know, I think I like to say he liked me right away. I think um, you know playing on his line and, and and you know he loves to get points. He loves to score goals. And, and when you help him do that, you know you're gonna you're gonna get some brownie points. And um, you no, know, we've still maintained a really good friendship. Um, no, he's he's an easy guy to talk to. Um, he loves scoring goals. I mean, you guys see the way he he's even celebrating. You know, on a team like Chicago this year, when he scores goals, you know, he's fired up and he, and he wants to win. Um, and obviously, we'll see what happens with him in the next couple of days. But I think everyone kind of everyone kind of knows what's going to happen. It just hasn't happened yet. But um, you know, to to get to play with a guy like that and, and have him become a friend, I've been pretty fortunate to play with some some unbelievably good players. And and uh, you know, sometimes you just sit back and think like. You know, like like I was on my line for like three years, and you know, it was so fun to be a part of this because he's so um, he was so intense on the ice, but he just wanted you to be good. Like he wanted you to to have success, and he wanted you to to make the plays. And he he told me that he's like, I'm going to yell at you sometimes, it's because I know you can make the plays. And you know, so that that when you hear that from someone, it, it, you know, it, like I said, it fire, fires you up, and it, it makes you want to be great as well. And the guys who can't make the plays, he just doesn't talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> just get off, get off my line. Treatment. Talk to my assistant. <laughs> no, but he does love to score goals. And, and if you set him up for a few goals or, or you put a couple of his passes in, it goes a long way for sure. Uh, Dylan, we've heard so much about uh, Jonathan Taves' leadership. What was it like playing with a guy like that? Yeah, I think you can really tell, Ray, when I, I remember the first day I walked into the dressing room, they had to hold practice because we took the red eye. We played a game in Arizona, me and Perlini, at one o'clock I think on a, on a Sunday afternoon and I got traded at about 6 30 I was on a plane at about 10 at night um and we we went right through the night to, to Chicago and and we got there in the morning and then um they had to hold practice back a little bit so when you when I first walked in it was like guys were kind of already dressed and ready to go and they made us like walk in the room and just like wave to everybody and say hi it was so awkward <laughs> But I remember oh, Steve like, the first day of school. Oh, it was so <laughs> awkward. It was so awkward. And you and weren't remember... proven yet, so you're like, this no. is so embarrassing. Yeah, like I, I exactly. It was Kainer so... gives him the dead fish. <laughs> it's like, kiss my kiss my fucking ring. My She's ring like, finger. Bitch. Was, boy was schmaltz. You better wake up, Stromer. Seabrook's the one yelling, like, holy, hurry up, boys, hurry up, boys. And I was like, Oh, I guess I better go. I just like turned around quickly and went to get my stuff on and we were dressed in on the ice pretty soon. That's where I kind of met everyone on the ice and then play the next night and you're kind of just thrown into the fire right away so you kind of meet guys on the fly but going back to Taves you can just see even on a bad team or not a great team how good of a leader he was just because you know, we can kind of keep everyone in check and I think you see that with a lot of the the really good teams like the, how many leaders they have on the team like Seabrook, Keith, Cam Ward, uh, you know Chris Kunitz like these guys they were all all leaders and all you know could have been wearing a letter um, but just you know the calming influence and 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 seeing what they do to be successful is it, it went a long way for sure all right i gotta ask i because this year you're in washington and you're just getting to just be around ovechkin that's more what i'm interested in right now <laughs> like, <laughs> this season this season being that special he's passing uh how and he's doing all these incredible things like but what's he like in the room is he chirping guys is he loud is he quiet like i've just always kind of wondered what it's like to be around him on a regular basis. Yeah, he's definitely loud. I mean, he's. <laughs> uh, I think the stories that you've heard about him are, are definitely true. He's, 
you know, he's a guy that loves to have fun. Um, you know, he worked, he worked really hard. He worked hard in practice. Um, you know, I think all the cliche things that you probably heard about him are true. Um, you know, he's, he's chirping guys for sure. He's like, I don't know if you guys have seen like the caps videos that they post before we go on the ice for, for, for the game. Like he's got a handshake with everyone. He's singing songs. He's, um, you know, joking around and, you know, to see a guy that, that scored that many goals, like you see Stamkos just scored his 500th, I believe it was. And, you know, when you're on a guy, a team with a guy that just scored 800, it's like 500 doesn't even seem like that much. And obviously it's like, there's like, I think 40 players in the NHL that have ever, or maybe even less than that, that have scored 500 goals. Um, but just being around a complete legend, it's, you know, in every, every aspect of life, he's, you know, he's, you know, been to the Olympics. He's, you know, one, I think he's won like nine rocket Richards. Um, no, he just passed Gordie Howe and some of the guys like make jokes. Like imagine passing Gordie Howe in anything, like in anything, <laughs> like yeah. John Carlson says it a lot. Like, like Mr. Hockey, like you just passed Mr. Hockey. Like that's the guy's name. So, I mean, to be on his team, it, it's something that I never would have thought of. My little brother had a Oveshkin jersey when we were growing up and it's like, now I'm on, I play with him and I'm on his line and I see him every day. It's like, sometimes you don't even believe it, but um, no, he's a heck of a guy. And, and, you know, there's a reason why, you know, everyone, everyone talks so highly of him. He's a bit of a farm animal. Have you uh, have you got to see what he eats for pregame? Have you like dialed it in? He's been known as a, a, cro- a sauce crosser, where he, that, put, that, he put the yeah that that is true. That is true. He I think he, you know for playing seventeen years, I don't think I've ever seen a guy get so excited for for pregame meal like he does every time. He orders it in so, from this from from this place, and it, like I think it's called Mama Lucia. I don't want to get the name wrong. I think that's what it's called, and he just. You know, he's singing when he gets off the ice in morning skate. He's ready for his pregame meal. He's he's so excited. He's trying to get other guys to eat his, his the what he eats, and um, he's mixing sauces together. And a few guys actually do do eat from the same place. He gets it delivered to the rink, and um, you know he he does mix the sauces. I don't know who who said that first, but <laughs> I remember seeing that. I was like, is this really no, true? Boyd yeah. Gordon told me about it, and it would drive him crazy because he would go get the the Alfredo. And there'd be the the marinara sauce all over it because he'd be crossing the things where he wouldn't change the the what do you call them ladles spoons? <laughs> Is it a ladle? Is a ladle yeah. a word yeah. already? La- yeah, ladle. Yeah, first yeah, soup ladle. Probably sauces too. Yeah. Speaking of other weird shit that's going on, uh, you touched on the the handshake line. These guys are fucking hitting each other's cocks and asses all through warm up. What's with this S and M routine? And have you got involved? What do you got? Like nipple clamps on underneath your gear and shit. <laughs> No, I think they just, you know, these guys have been on the same team for a long time. And I was actually thinking about this the other day when I was like, because I'm sure you've seen like Oshie and, and Wilson do like the, you know, the baseball swing at each other's asses in, 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 on the ice and warm ups. And it's just like when you play so many games in a season and you're, these guys have been on the same team for so long, um, you know, I think they just try to keep it light and, and, and get the handshakes going. I'm sure it's a bit of a bit of superstition at this point. Um, you know, they kind of just do whatever, but. Once the, when a new guy comes in, they kind of just make a handshake and, and you kind of just go with it. I'm a guy that hangs out in the room until like the clock goes down. And then so I do a few handshakes with some guys in there and, and uh, then walk out to the ice. And I, I can hear Ovi yelling or, or Osh yelling, you know, from <laughs> from from inside the dressing room at every rink. And they just I think it's just something to keep it light. And, um, you know, the boys have fun with it. And it's pretty funny. I know the fans start to get into it, too. Like the fans in, in Washington are like waiting for Wilson to like baseball swing oh she's ass before before he takes a shot and warm up. <laughs> oh yeah the women in the front row are just losing their minds when wilson comes out and they're i mean even tj oh she's a bit of a handsome bastard too you guys got a fucking good looking lineup what do you guys call it again uh man man, rocket, man, rocket, rocket, man, rocket, rocket, man yeah. missiles <laughs> <laughs> well, who's got hey, who's got the worst handshake pregame routine like one where you're like enough of this shit who, who, who who's the, if you could eliminate one from the island which one would it be I'm going to chirp Van Riemsdyk because he chirps me a lot. We we chirp each other a lot, um, but he chirps me definitely more than I chirp him. And he, you know, he waits till the, the our goalies yell 30 on the clock before we go and he stands up and does his little routine and then has to give everyone a high five, but he has to do it in order. So it's like, oh, fuck. If guys are, if guys are in like, you know, like usually in at home, he goes around and like just dabs everyone up before he goes on the ice. But when we're on the road, you know, not everyone's in the same stall as they're in at home. So he's going from like, left side of the room to the right side of the room to you know the, to outside the hallway to that to, to hit everyone and, and say hello to everyone and do whatever he does before the ice so i'll, I'll chirp him I, I if there's one guy i can go without it's it, it's him for the handshakes fuck him yeah fuck family he was like uh, laviolette what's he like in the locker room he seems like a player's coach but yet when things need to be said he seems like he gets pretty firm he looks like he could snap this I, yeah. I think you hit the nail right on the head i think exactly what you just said he one of the things i was surprised about when i got here was 
no, he's been around for a long time. So, but you know, players don't talk too much about coaches. I think like you hear some things about other guys, but I had I had no expectations. I didn't know much about him. He called me when I signed there uh, in July. Just said he's happy to have me. He loves me on the power play. He's watched me for a long time, and and you know he said like you know said great things about me, and you know he said he's gonna, I'm going to play a lot, and the team has high expectations, and and so do the fans. Um, but one thing I, I really was impressed with was his um, his like motivation. Um, you know he's been here for I think three or four years, and a lot of these guys have been here for for longer than that. Um, and I still think he he pushes the right buttons to get guys pretty fired up before the game, or if things are going awry, he knows what to say at the right times to to get everyone, you know, kind of fired up for that moment. And, and like I said before, it's a long season. There's 82 games. So, you know, you don't want to be saying the same thing all the time over and over again. And I think he does a good job of mixing it up and, and you know, pushing the right buttons for, for guys. And I think I've, I've noticed that since I've been here. It's been kind of a, a weird last couple of days, I guess, in Washington. I mean, you guys are only three points out of the wild card after kind of a tough 10-game stretch here, but had a huge win against the Rangers and then a tough game the next day against Buffalo. But then you see Hathaway and Orlov, you know they're traded obviously Craig Smith comes back but it's one of those things where like all right we could still make the playoffs but are they almost kind of planning on us not making the playoffs like what's what's the room discussion was it kind of shocking to lose those two guys or or hearing those rumblings did you kind of expect that I don't think anyone expected it I mean like like you said we're, we're so close to the to the wild card the problem is we've played more games than everyone so it looks like our winning percentage you know isn't as great as some of these other teams in front of us but um yep. you know we got to the rink against against the Rangers I think it was yeah it was no it was the Ducks it was a, the game against the Ducks the day the game before the Rangers and um you know Hathaway and and Orlov's name wasn't on the board for the lineup and everyone you know I think when you see that everyone kind of you know understands that you know they're obviously getting traded or you see guys in the round of the league that have been held out for for trades um so you know you, you get to the rink and you're like you know obviously everyone's kind of thinking like are, are we just like selling or what's kind of going on um and they they get some picks back for for those guys and those those Orlov's been here for a long time so I know um you know it was a lot for a lot of the guys it was tough to see him go and um it's just part of the business I guess you know we're kind of taking it day by day you know no one really knows what's going to happen I think the deadline's like three or four days away um you know we got a lot of UFAs coming up so but we're still in it so it's like it's a it's a bit a mix of both like we're we're right there close to playoff contention obviously we got to start getting some wins but you know I don't think anyone really knows what's going to happen besides you know the people up up top and we're just trying to take it day by day and, and, and hopefully we can, you know, make it make it a tough decision for them. I think a lot of people forget too, at the beginning of the season, you guys were dealing with a shit ton of injuries. I think at one point you guys had 40, 40 million on the IR. So now that you guys are, are getting guys back healthy, Wilson's back, of course, Backstrom's back. Like, what do you think needs to change about your guys' game in order to solidify that wild card spot? Because the way things are looking, I don't think it's going to be possible for you guys to squeeze in the top three. So what do you guys need to do as a group? And what is maybe Laviolette harping on the most for you guys to squeak in? Biz, I know they give you some shit about some tough questions, some bad questions, but that's a, that's a good question. I'm gonna, I'm buddy, gonna I'm a fucking... I, I don't boy, Biz. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, sometimes the brain's not no clicking, buddy, but sometimes shaming. it is. Yeah, thank um, you, my friend. Thank you. No, no problem. Um, Who's got yeah, the I mean, biggest dick on the team? Oh, here we go. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but like... You kind of touched on how many injuries we've had, um, and our, our season's kind of, you know, gone a bit bit downhill ever since uh, Carlson got injured. Um, he got injured on the Jan- uh, December twenty third because it was the game before Christmas, and obviously it was a pretty gross injury. You guys, I'm sure, have seen it. But um, when you lose a number one defenseman and, and a guy like that that plays that many minutes, runs the power play, you know, plays every situation, penalty kills, plays a ton of five on five. You know, he's still leading our team in, in you know average time on ice, and he's been out for a couple months and. Um, when you lose a guy like that, I think it's it's tough to tough to you know find someone that can fill that role. I don't think anyone really can because you know he he makes really good money. He's a great player. He's been around for a long time, and um, you know we've had some other guys step up on defense. But you know it's tough when you lose a guy like that. So if I had the answer to to your question about what what we can do to to make the playoffs, I think it's just um, we we haven't been getting out to good starts at all. We've been we've been trailing and chasing every game for the last like nine or ten games and. Um, you know, we when we played against the Rangers, that was our first win in like since Boston, since the first game after the break. And you know, we got a lead, and it felt like the game was just so much easier because you weren't chasing that goal, you weren't chasing like the the, the game the whole time. Um, and and every game, it seems like we're getting out. You know, we're getting down two or three nothing, and then you know, teams can just tighten it up after that and and, and kind of just lock it down. And um, you know, if we get out to a lead, that game against the Rangers felt so easy because we we had the lead, and they were the ones chasing. We were getting more chances, and then. 
you know, when you're down, you think you're going to get all these chances and try to f- climb your way back in, but teams just lock it down when they're up two or three. So, um, my, my answer to your, to your really good question is get out to better starts. Um, I, I, I got one quick follow up uh, about those injuries, Backstrom. And I think a lot of people wrote him off in the off season, given with the hip surgery and everything that he's had to go through to get back. Like how was it witnessing him doing all his his therapy workouts and all that in order to get back? I, I, if I'm not mistaken, he's back in the lineup and back playing to to his full yeah. potential. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's been playing good too. Um, you know, to see a guy that at, that's you know played 16 years and been relatively healthy for most of his career, and then I I wasn't here obviously the last couple of years, but guys say you know he was really struggling with his hip and it was really bothering him. And to be honest, since he's been back, no one's really even said a word about it. Like I think it's just it's been feeling really good. Um, he's been feeling comfortable and confident and, and, you know, I think there's only been one other hockey player. I think he knew a guy in Sweden that had had the same surgery. Um, and he talked to that guy a little bit and the guy said, you know, it's, it's been going really well. I I got both done. Um, you know, it's been feeling good. Uh, so I think Backstrom that kind of eased his, you know, his mindset on it a little bit. Um, and he got the, the, the new surgery done and, um, you know, he worked hard to get back and he, he's been feeling good. I, like, like I said, no one even really talks about it now because I think he's been feeling so good. So it's obviously great to see. And it's, it's huge for for our team he makes some of the the you know the nicest passes like he makes these little plays obviously he's not the quickest guy um but he makes these little plays in tight and and these little sauce passes and you know you know he's a big reason why we score that many goals he's he's got a lot of a lot of apples on those goals don i know she a younger brother plays for hershey have you guys ever played on a team before other than when you were little kids um no um no we haven't we we played when we were i think i was six and he was four and we were on our little team in, in, in port credit and uh other than that we haven't this year at camp was like the first time I've ever really been on, you know, obviously during the season, like the ice with him, it was, it was kind of weird how it all worked out. Um, Hershey was really interested in him and, and, you know, I'm happy that you know, he found a spot there and we played a, a little scrimmage with each other, uh, during camp. <laughs> you know, it was weird. I mean, you know, you're growing up watching your brother, you know, the whole time, but never played with them. Even in junior, he was on Hamilton and I was on Erie and the four games that I was there when he, he would have played Erie. Um, I was at World Juniors both times, so I've never even really been on the same ice with him during during the season. So, um, you know, to have that experience with him, and he's only two hours away. We played the Ducks last week, so I played against Rye, and Matt came down for dinner, and you know, he's only two hours away, so came down for dinner, stayed the night, had the day off the next day. So, um, you know, it's nice to be so close to the family. Didn't he get a uh, five times five too? Ryan did, yeah. Ryan got the exact same deal. Fucking yeah. hey, the whole family's just cashing in. I remember the last time we talked. It's just last time we it. talked, it, it kind of blew up a bit. That you said my my dad should sell his uh, his firm or something. So I remember that blew up. So <laughs> yeah, I tell that to every every dad who's got oh, eight geez. kids in the show. Who I mean, look, look at the list. You got the Hughes brothers. Actually, Wit is uh, is in Florida right now. Where are you, Naples? Uh, Estero. And my parents, um, ironically enough, they they bought a, a condo and right beneath them is the stall. So Henry Super Sperm Stall. I actually saw him this morning. He was airing out his gear. He must have skated this morning. So obviously, you know that that's probably the number one. I guess I guess Mr. Sutter back in the day, Biz, he might be the original king of it with all yeah. those Sutters running around the league. Well, they knew how to do that with the turkey baster because they had all the horses on the property. So that was just easy easy running, right? All right, what do you mean the turkey? That's how they used to do it. I, I'm, I know. I'm laughing. I, I'm, I'm laughing. Well, there's the <laughs> Shit, stalls. Man. You got stalls. You got Sutters. Bands, Strom. So there's a lot of S names in there. Maybe that has something to do yeah. with it. Okay. Uh, Speaking of farm Hughes, animals, oh, go Hughes ahead. Brothers, the Kachucks are obviously obviously doing really well, and their dad played too. So, um, you know a lot of uh, a lot of brothers out there. Van Riemsdyk. So I guess I got to show Van Riemsdyk after I kind of. Oh went. yeah. <laughs> uh, speaking of farm animals, uh, back, going back to Ovi. Like I'm sure your buddies and group techs who who aren't in the show maybe don't even play hockey, but follow. Uh, they're like, what's Ovi like? What's Ovi like? What are some stories when you you first got there that you got to experience that you can share with us about Ovi? Like just like silly shit, <laughs> like in practice and stuff. That's what I'm interested in. Is he dialed in or is he kind of in his own world, Yager style? Yeah, I think. I mean, he's. He, I think it's a bit of both. I think he, he's kind of like like he knows when to turn it on and and knows when you know it's a day after a game and we're we have a practice and everyone you know it's like a thirty minute practice and and you know. He's kind of just going in and, you know, doing his thing. I'm not sure. I haven't heard the Yager story, but I mean, he, I think he he knows when to turn it on and, and when to turn it, and when to you know kind of float around it in practice. But um, you know, my buddies are like, you know, they message me and they're saying like, you know, well, what's Ovi like? And I'm just like, it's hard to describe. I mean, you guys saw after he got that 800th goal in Chicago and the hat trick, and it, and it was so it was crazy. That was one of the craziest games I've ever been a part of. 
and he gets off the ice and we just shower him in Bud Lights. And I think I was just the happiest man. And like, even after like the, the 800 goal, he just gets showered in Bud Lights and everyone's just, you know, he just grabs one right away and just starts chugging it after the game, right in the dress. <laughs> it's all over his gear. Um, you no, know, but he, you know, he likes to have fun and, uh, you know, he's, he's one of the, you know, he's, he's a legend. I mean, he's like, people talk about him, but he's like top five of all time, maybe top 10 of all time. And he's, you know, hopefully going to pass Gretzky and, you know, hopefully I can be a part of it. And it's just like, sometimes you just got to pinch yourself. Like, is this guy, like everyone knows the the goal when Gretzky breaks the record from McThor. Like everyone's seen the goal he runs on the yeah. ice. Um, and to think that, you know, Ovi scored his 802nd goal. That was the goal that, you know, everyone ta- and everyone remembers from, from, from Gretzky. And, you know, I think everyone's looking forward to that moment. I mean, I, I'm certainly excited for it. I hope, I hope I'm the one that gets the apple on it. I mean, you got to get the apple on that. That's like what that, I was going to say. You go down in history. Like that, that's yeah. history. I got, I got the apple on 801 to tie Gordy House. So I kept the stick from that. Um, they rolled oh, over that's the side. awesome. Yeah. So that, that was like one of the, one of the coolest moments of the year for sure. Just, I dropped past, gave him a drop pass. Um, you know, because he got the hat trick, he got the 800th goal. So he got 780, 780, 798, 99, and 800 in Chicago. And they didn't score for like, I don't know, five, five games maybe. And, you know, it was, I was on his line. So I'm like, fuck, like I gotta, I gotta make some plays here and then get him the puck. And there was a couple of chances where yeah. he, where he had to get it. And that, um, and then against Winnipeg, it was the game before Christmas. So we had a couple, a little break and then gave him a drop pass and he fired a five hole. And if you watch the replay, I'm, I think I'm the happiest guy. I jump into the jump. John Carlson jumps into the pile and I jump into the pile and Gustafson jumps on me. And, um, and then he gets 802 on the empty net or so. Um, you know, that was that he did. He, one story I can tell is he he took uh, after that game, you know he he mentioned something to a reporter that like well, what are you gonna do to celebrate and he's like hot dogs and nachos shit. <laughs> I was like that is definitely not what we ate that night because he took us out to a to a nice meal with with a bunch of the guys and whoever whoever could come after that because it was the break the next day and um you no know, he he definitely is is one of the most generous people I've ever met in my life he you know so he took put care the of card down he put the gold card down oh yeah he took care of everything he you know he's you know one of a kind when it when it comes to that he's you know never never afraid to to put the card down he's um you know he, he like i can't even describe like we had like we had pasta we had steak we had you know caviar we had whatever you whatever caviar you get, oh yeah caviar like, big, big caviar guy he put oh, ketchup he, all on those it. russians are man they drink the, they are drinking eat the most expensive foods i will say just looking at him he looks like he has the stinkiest farts on the planet does, does he have stinky farts he must have stinky like this thing there's the question there's the tnt oh, uh, biz how because how, how, his diet just right. everything about it, he looks like he's 55 is he 55 i can't i can't confirm that he's 55 he does i mean i think a, a lot of hockey players you know rip some parts i guess come on biz i gave you props <laughs> about the question before and then uh <laughs> no but he he like he it, it's crazy like he drinks like he drinks like pepsis or cokes like like it's water like I, I i you guys seen him drinking on the bench i know that's out there he like he he just goes like yells to the trainer like brock coke <laughs> just fire him over a new coke and he just cracks it open and he's just i don't, I don't know i like i think if there's a like a documentary or something about, about him when he's done playing um you know i i don't really know how to how to describe it i think you know i think everyone's going to be excited if that comes out in, in the future i think it's it's him and uh, him and Kessel should be in the same Hall of Fame class <laughs> when they get inducted. Just they must have been made in the same lab. They're, they're both their bodies define science the way that they treat their bodies, yet still keep on ticking. But he's so he's so powerful too. Like you know, he's I think he's thirty seven or thirty eight, um, yeah, and so. he still like he still goes goes past guys like no problem. Like when he turns on the Jets, he just goes around guys, and he's so strong that like. Um, he just won our muscles guys off. He did it a couple times last game where he just literally got a puck on the half wall in in neutral zone, blows by a guy wide and gets a great A chance. And, you know, you see some of the goals he scored in his past. I think the one against Montreal when he like backhands it off the wall and does like a spin around. I think it was around Hammerlick, I want to say. And then yeah. he slides, scores on Price like from his ass. It's like, you know, those goals just don't happen like to anyone. They They, they just happen to him. Last last question. I know you got to run, but you mentioned Kane. Will kind of he he mentioned to you like oh, I'm going to yell at you if you're not playing up to your potential. And McKinnon's been known to do that. Will Ovi give it to guys if they're not playing up to where they should be, or is he more kind of lets guys go on their own? I think um, 
I think let's go, let's guys go on their, on their own a little bit more. I think, you know, he's not a guy that like screams at guys on the bench or, or yells at guys. I think, um, you know, when I signed my contract the other day, some people were asking like, no, what's it going to be like to play with Ovi? And I'm like, he, it is a little bit similar to Kane where, you know, he wants you to make that pass because I think he knows you can make that pass and he's seen it before. Um, you know, but he gets open and, you know, he's waiting for the, for that one tee and got a few goals, a few apples that way um, this year where just coming across the middle and, and, you know, he's waiting there loaded, ready to go. So you just got to put it in the right spot. And um, he scores a lot of goals where like the pucks are, are bouncing in his feet. He scored a few goals this year where it's like, a guy gives him like a bouncing pass off a stick and it's in his feet and he goes like stick skate to stick so fast and just pull and release and it's like knuckle you know, pucks too half of the time like they're well, that, rolling that's he doesn't thing. care I mean, Kaner would give it to me if, if, uh, back in the day well not back in the day a couple of years for those couple of years that I, I wouldn't keep them flat you know he goes just just keep them flat okay <laughs> keep, keep the puck flat and so when I got with Ovi you know I, I've definitely thrown a couple of muffins over to him and he's just connected on them like it's a f- perfectly flat pass like Kaner's pass no but, this has been a great well, breakdown Strowman, man we been, appreciate it great we appreciate your time i know you guys are um are chilling today but thank you very much hopefully you guys go on a little bit of a run and can end up getting in and and we appreciate it congrats no on thanks your deal once me. again yeah thanks a lot guys i appreciate it anytime big thanks to dylan strong for jumping on with us his second appearance on spit and chicklets nice kid biz huh really enjoyed chatting with him awesome guy oh, yeah. i'm so happy for him that he finally got an opportunity Especially with with the offensive upside, it was just a matter of time before he blossomed. And 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 I think you you asked him too, Wit. I don't think he really got his opportunity in Arizona. Um, and I just think sometimes these guys come in, the expectations are so high, and, and you know, especially being a, a top three overall draft pick. So just an unreal guy. And hey, they got a lot of work cut out for him if they're going to get that wild card spot. But uh, we'll see. We'll see how things go. Absolutely. Uh, Thursday, uh, Blues coach Craig Berube. Basically emptied both barrels on his team after blowing a 2 nothing lead, then losing in overtime to the Cox 3-2. Uh, he said, quote, Our best players don't play with any passion, no emotion, and no inspiration at all. They don't play inspired hockey. You cannot play in this league without emotion, grit, being inspired. They're getting paid lots of money, and they're not doing the job. End of story. Whew. Some tough quotes. Uh, the Ugh. next day, Robert Thomas was doing his weekly radio hit. He said, It's frustrating to hear that. What he said couldn't be further from the truth. Well, before practice, GM Doug, Doug Armstrong come in, address the whole team, I think, just to sort of get everybody on the same page. But uh, I'll go to you first, Biz. When a guy guys get traded away like that, to, to, have you seen it have an adverse effect in the room? Like, you know, they're basically like kind of waving the flag on the season? Um, I think I, I think that they had to based on the performance of the overall team. Uh, I don't, even some of the guys that they parted ways with, I think we can all agree that Ryan O'Reilly got off to a very slow offensive start. Uh, Tarasenko and and the relationship with the organizations organization seemed to fizzle out. Um, I think that they, based on the contracts that were handed out, I think that these they felt that these guys are the next wave of guys who could take St. Louis to that to to winning a Stanley Cup again. I get hesitant to handing over these deals. A lot of them feel like 50-50 Russian roulette, where some of them pan out, some of them don't. Where I. I mean, Kairou's over a point a game or at a point a game, but I think that where Barube gets a little bit frustrated is in the the, the mistakes being made, uh, the maybe lack of the 200-foot game. Uh, Thomas, I haven't really watched him that closely this, this year, but if Barube's saying it, I'm pretty sure he can assess talent having been around as long as he has as a player and coach, and I probably have to agree with the results on the season as to most of the top end guys in this lineup and what they've done now there's no running for these guys anymore now there's no ryan o'reilly there there's no uh, uh peron who w- left in the off season uh, Sh- uh schwartz who was taken in the expansion draft so all these guys uh petrangelo who ended up going away from vegas so all these guys who were leading this team when they were winning they're all gone so the reins have been completely handed off to robert thomas kairu and, and a few of the others. So I would I would say that based on the overall season, his his statement was very accurate. I think that some of these young guys are going to have to take a long, hard look in the mirror. And he's bang on about saying that if, if, if you're not going to bring that intensity night in, night out, there's way too many top-end players in the league who are type A personalities that are going to bring it, and you're not going to end up making playoffs and, and, and winning shit. If you don't bring that edge, look at look at around the league and the the players driving their teams. 
take a look around. They compete. Like, they compete every night, night in and night out. We mentioned it last podcast. I think I've been fucking saying it every week now because of how frustrating the Penguins have been. Sid, Sid's mucking it up with guys, and he's already won three cups. So that if you're not out there to prove things night in and night out, and it's not just the flying up and down the ice and toe drag this, toe drag that, it's winning the battles, all the little shit. So, uh, see, Biz, odd, I think odd I for think... Thomas to say to kind of go back, and it couldn't be further from the truth. Where uh, I don't know, man, I don't know. Well, the I think the the whole issue can be looked upon as like. These guys are around point per game, right? I, Kairo's there, Thomas is there, Buchnevich is there. He's missed a little time, but he's still point per game. Dude, you can get points and you can get your cookies doing it the wrong way, if that makes any sense. You can get power play points. You can get different instances of producing offense without playing the way you need to play to win. I haven't watched enough of the Blues. It's kind of what you said, Biz. I just kind of believe Barubi based on his track record, how he played the game, and how he's coached the Stanley Cup champion to say he can bring these guys in the room and say, listen, you, yeah, you get your points, but it doesn't, that's not what I'm talking about because we need you to produce points, but I think you can produce them while playing a different style. And I, I know it sounds like I'm calling these guys out. I just said I haven't seen enough, but when he goes on runs or rants like this, it's like there has to be something there where these guys could be sitting around saying, well, I'm, I'm, I'm doing my job offensively, but there's another side of the game that you have to play a certain way to be successful. So young players, I think a lot of times, and, and offensive players, they look at like, all right, my stats are good, but you, you've, you I've had enough coaches, Biz, you had enough coaches where like you could be producing and you're you're not getting the job done in, in the grand scheme of things. So I think that's probably what Ruby's looking at. Like, I don't care how many points you produce. And yes, we pay you to pr- to get points and produce on the power play, but like, I need you grinding. I need you back checking. I need you playing defense. I need you going in the corners, coming out with the puck. So there's a disconnect a lot of times between guys in terms of production and how you're actually playing. And it's the same way players can finish a game where they get a couple cheap assists. Like I did my job and the coach watches the video. It's like, dude, you didn't do anything. So I think the Blues and those guys are proud athletes. They'll probably start playing a little different. But it was also surprising to see that Thomas comeback in terms that that's it couldn't be further from the truth because obviously there's a complete disconnect between what he's saying and what Thomas and, and Kyrou probably think they're doing. So we'll see how it plays out. But it is a different time for St. Louis. At least they got a guy off waivers that's going to help push the pace and, and get them to that next level. Yeah, Kapanen. He's been yeah. great. Well, it's funny you mentioned Kapanen, Biz. Uh, the, the guy that Pittsburgh signed two years, $6.4 million deal last summer. Well, they put him on waivers the other day. I think that he was just going to go down to the minors, but St. Louis ended up picking him up, added him to the roster. I mean, they pretty much did Pittsburgh a favor, but Hextall, he's taking a beat right now. The fans were chanting, fire Hextall. Uh, some of the beat writers have been all over him. So uh, what do you got for us on Pittsburgh, Busy? I, I In all seriousness, though, I, I like the pickup by St. Louis. I agree it is a bit of a buddy pass to Ronnie Hextall. I would imagine... Uh, uh, Armstrong's probably like, hey, I'll, I'll help you out, buddy, with all the scrutiny you're getting and all these athletic articles ripping you. Um, take a flyer on him. Maybe that is the landing spot. You said it about Gary Onoff going to Montreal. Maybe he'll go all of a sudden find his his, his game up top there. But, uh, but o- overall, just a very disappointing season so far. Disappears way too much. And uh, it seems like they're going to have a, a, a large number of guys in uh, in Barube's bringing push in the pace group and practice and trying to find that uh, that that overall competitiveness. I'm surprised Kapanen didn't work out in Pittsburgh. I mean, he could skate, he could play in a top line. I kind of imagine him fitting in somewhere, and, and it just I don't know if it was lack of work ethic. I don't know if Mike Sullivan couldn't stand his game, and then that snowballs. He loses his confidence. Who knows what ended up happening. But talk about a disappointment. I mean, you make a sick, you make a signing like that, and boom, four or five months later, he's on waivers. It's like, what the fuck just happened? But that's kind of been Pittsburgh's entire season. So let's see if he can kind of reclaim his career, get things going again, and, and, and find a chance to really thrive in St. Louis. But how quickly things went downhill for him with the Penguins was shocking. Yeah, I'm not sure if you heard Mike uh, Sullivan's comment after the game. He said, our Rasta is our Rasta. I don't know if it was an intentional shot at Hextall, but it was kind of a, like an, an indictment of what he was dealing with there. So, you know, they're going to grind through it. They did have a, a tough stretch. They won two games over the weekend. They're still in the mix, but I don't know if they're going to get in the Let, playoffs. Let's, or let's talk about this. We go back to um, Bobby Clark. He was very critical of, of uh, some of Ronnie's moves or lack thereof. 
Um, I, I guess I have enough faith in him where I'm okay with his patience and seeing maybe if this group that they have right now can figure it out. They haven't had long periods of time where they've all been healthy. Um, I think that it would be a little bit idiotic if they didn't do something to shake things up in that locker room going into the to, to the deadline here. Uh, so who knows? Maybe a deal doesn't get made and they all figure it out and he ends up looking like the genius in the long run. But I don't know, man. It just seems very bizarre that at this point with what he's seen and the ups and downs of the season so far and how much the media has been barking about improving that third line. Because... Guys, the top six has not let this team down. Like they are still getting the point, but if anything, it's all the 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 other guys that have not brought their game who have been letting them down. Mainly the third line in the last like probably month to six weeks, in which the guy the the media has been all over them about. So they got to go out and do something, in my opinion. But I'll trust a, 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 a I'll trust Ron Hextall, I guess, before I get critical until I see what what the final results are. A huge two wins though, because they got the St. Louis win in overtime where they blew it. St. Louis tied it up kind of late, and then they had to travel back home to Pittsburgh. They took on Tampa and put a beating on them. I think they scored five at the end of the second period or first period. So must needed wins for a team. All of a sudden, they're like they're looking, they're on the outside looking in, like, oh my God, is Pittsburgh going to miss the playoffs? So. At least you see a little bit of a of a comeback this weekend, but yeah, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to imagine that they do something like we're talking about what what Breeze was done in Tampa and all these teams going for it, willing to mortgage the future. Like if there's any team that's willing to mortgage the future, it's Pittsburgh. But the problem is they just have nothing left to give. So I don't know how he's gonna end up making a move and what they can end up actually doing. But you think it's all hands on deck in terms of changing something and bringing somebody in that may be able to help out that bottom six. So. It'll be interesting Friday because if nothing happens, Penguins fans may completely lose their mind. Uh, a couple other deals we're going to go over real quick here. Chicago uh, acquired defenseman Nikita Zaitsev from Ottawa along with their second round pick in 23 and a fourth and 26 for the old future considerations. Uh, he's in the sixth year of a seven-year deal, 4.5 AAV. I don't know if this is just a salary dump by Ottawa or what the deal is, if they're trying to do something a little bit later. Uh, the Blackhawks also traded Jack Johnson back to Colorado. who He won the Cup at last year. Colorado sent uh, Andreas Eglin back to the Blackhawks. Both players will be UFA after this season. And we were just talking about the Blues. Uh, they traded Ivan Babashev to Vegas uh, for prospect Zach Dean. Uh, Vegas once again trades one of their first-round picks to get a little help at the deadline. And let's see, Vegas also picked up defenseman Dyson Mayo from Arizona uh, for Shea Weber's contract and a fifth-round pick in 23. Uh, Dyson's in the first year of a three-year, $2.85 million extension. Was most recently with AHL Tucson. Played 15 games with Arizona this year. Biz, do you know anything about that kid? You guys see Pronger's tweet? No, oh, what do you uh, say? <laughs> about Weber joining their foursome, Hosa and Datsuk and Pronger. <laughs> the, four, the four legends on the Coyotes roster right now. Yeah. They got to retire all their jerseys. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking yeah, well, A. Weber's deal, it's a year 11 of a 14-year deal, carries a $7.85 million cap hit uh, that will help the Yotes reach the salary floor in case they need to. Uh, Vegas currently has $15.7 million on long-term injury reserve between Stone, uh, Leonard, and Patrick. Uh, but boys, something weird this year. I don't remember this really happening at all much in the past, but all these guys, they're sitting for trades. Have you ever seen Trend this before? Trendsetters. I mean, the Coyotes uh, Jake, are trendsetters. Jacob Chickren, seven games he's been sitting. Uh, Jeff Rikoff and uh, Columbus, seven games. Luke Shedd, three games. I, I mean, is this going to be a deterrent? Uh, like, the, uh, this going to screw things up? What, what's it, the deal with, with this? It's a weird. It's a weird thing, but I've actually for a long time wondered why it didn't happen. Like, it almost makes sense to me. Like, all right, we're trading this guy. If he gets hurt, we're completely fucked. We're not going to get anything back for him. So. Why not play him? Now, the the whole other side of it is like, all right, well, people are just going to be sitting around like this Chikrin situation. I, I feel for the Coyotes. I feel for him. It's like this has to get figured out. Let's fucking hope he gets traded by Friday because he, he might end up like, I don't know what he's going to do if he doesn't get dealt. But you're paying these guys all this money and, and then you understand like we can't risk them getting hurt. So I see that side of it. When it comes to seven games in Chikrin's instance and, and the games are going up for Gavrikov and the other guys you mentioned, that's when the player starts getting frustrated. Like, all right, so I'm going to get traded. I haven't played in a month. How am I going to fit into this new team? So I, I understand both sides of it, but I, I have been surprised in other seasons that it didn't happen sooner where guys are like, all right, well, we, we can't risk him getting hurt because that's happened in the past where all of a sudden a guy gets injured and then you can't trade him at all. 
So I don't know your opinion on on it, Biz, because some people, it, it seems to be driving some people mad. Yeah, I, I think that they're eventually going to make a rule about this if they don't change the hard cap situation because you see all these, th- even the Patrick Kane deal taking a, a, a week to go through because they got to figure out we're going to, they're, they're, they're going to put all this dead money, which third party team is going to take some of that on so they can keep his, his salary down so he could fit it within that team's cap. So it's overall just a shit show. I hope they address it in the next CBA so it doesn't have to be like this. But at the point where you know he might end up missing 12 to 15% of the season just by b- being held on the shelf for a trade purpose, it does seem a little bit ridiculous based on the amount of money these guys are making. And also people are paying money to come watch these players play and they don't get to see the stars out there So or, or, or high caliber players. It's a shit show. I, I hope the Coyotes get the return they want for Chikrin. I don't know what the asking price is. I'm not in these meetings. I'm just a peasant. Uh, so that's pretty much all I got on it. Uh, Biz, I know you want to talk about Carolina as well. They haven't really been doing much of anything. Uh, people are kind of getting on the GM, Don Waddell. They did get Pat Shirey back for a couple of games. Unfortunately, he got hurt again. Uh, they do have $12.5 million in long-term injury reserve, so they can you know go over that with a decent salary. But what kind of move should they be looking at and what should they do? Well, I was going to go to that stadium series game, but every single fan of the Carolina Hurricanes came up to me and Grinelli and asked, what is Don Waddell going to do with the deadline? So I said, enough's enough. I'm not going to the tailgate. Get me the fuck out of this town until this guy makes a goddamn move. He has to do something. And there's a few names that have popped up. I got one via text. It could be a rumor boy situation. Kevin Hayes. In my opinion, in my opinion, their 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 biggest hole right now is at second line center. And for if you don't want to leverage the future, this seems like a good idea because you could probably go get him for very cheap because they could dump off his salary. I think he's set to make seven seven million in the next four years. How many more years does Hazy have less left, left on his Maybe contract? Maybe five. Maybe five years. So that is one name that's popped up where he could fit right in the middle there and help that that second line out. Um, another name that has popped up uh, in the last week is Schmaltz out of Arizona, and he has been red hot in the last 11 games, nine goals, six assists. He's buzzing. He's had a great season playing with Keller. Uh, Barrett Hayton's been their sentiment, and they have still been out there producing offense. Uh, the reason, and I know Carolina is a pretty cheap team, um, they've, you know, I think that's that's kind of known. It's it's public knowledge where their owner is a is a, is a bit of an alligator arm. Uh, but he's set to make in the next three years where his salary was backloaded, where he's making seven and a half, seven and a half, and maybe eight and a half. So he's in actual dollars. So his cap hits at five eight, but he's set to make all that money on the backside. So Arizona might be looking to move that off of the books, knowing that they're going to be probably not in a playoff situation so those are just a few names in which they could go out there and maybe make an instant impact but the longer you wait the less there is on the table and i don't know what you guys got got well got kevin to hayes contribute. has three more years after this year three okay three so, i thought it was four you know if they could end up doing that move yeah i, I saw his his name kind of pop up today that'd be great for him um obviously torts can't stand him and 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 then you 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 just look at carolina f- the fan base in terms of like they deserve something to happen and 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 it does make sense where they don't do rentals that's been kind of clear with that organization so maybe they bring in a guy with terms so the problem is like the big guns they're coming off the table Meyer there was rumors now he's in Jersey it's just it's more about the fact that everyone's doing something and they haven't done anything now Friday deadline will come and they will have made a move but you just wonder what's left and if they can really get creative and maybe get a guy that hasn't even been mentioned because every single year someone gets traded that you didn't think was getting traded, right? There's always a name that you're kind of shocked and surprised at. Maybe they're working one of those grind lines right now in terms of trying to figure out a guy and nobody even knows what's going on, but they got to do something. They have a full-blown legitimate chance to win the Stanley Cup and you can't stand Pat after making the move for Pat already in the summer, getting screwed over by his injury, and then you you sit around. It's like, no way, no way. We have money to spend. We have a team that can win. Something has to happen. Uh, Biz, Only you mentioned the up. Hurricanes owner being cheap. His uh, Kevin Hayes' real money, like you previously just mentioned, his money goes down from 7 to 6 to 5 over the next three years too, so he could save some real money there. Yeah, the last and- two years he's only making four, actually. 
Or maybe and no, because he's probably getting a bonus. Yeah, so 5.25 the last two years and 6.5 next year with a cap hit of 7.5. So so I, I would imagine Philly would be happy to get that off the books given the relationship between Hazy and Torts because they're not in win mode right win mode right now. You could probably get away with not giving them a huge asset in return. I, I would imagine maybe even like a second rounder might get it done where you might have to pay a little bit more is where another team's going to have to eat some of the salary. And at that point, if you're getting hazy half price, that's a great second line center who can who can really he can really fit into most. He went over to Winnipeg. He could fit in offense. He could fit in there anywhere. He's a crafty type player. The other wild card name I was going to throw out there, and he's been there before, was Max Domi, who got dealt at the deadline. And you guys are saying, well, what does that have to do with the center position? This year, he's been bumped to center, and he's been doing a fucking half decent job. And when he's playing with with skilled guys like Patrick Kane, he's getting the job done. I don't know how much sauce you this a ragu sauce you saw him throwing the other night where they were going back and forth exchanging flying saucers. So, Not to mention he had the game he had the two goals in game seven against the Bruins. So at least, you know, there's some success there as well. That would probably be the the cheapest you could get to 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 fill in that hole. But going back to Carolina, make a fucking move or you guys are gonna be golfing with uh, Harry Styles again pretty soon. Biz, we don't get too many heavyweight matches in the NHL anymore, but Saturday night, Milan Lucic, Curtis McDermott, I don't know if it was the fight of the year, but probably one of the top three fights of the year. What's, uh, what's I've never expert? seen a crowd that horny for a fight when they were barking at each other with the lines of, linesmen in between. And maybe it's because you, you don't really get these, as you just mentioned. Luch, if there was any questions that that guy lost an edge as far as toughness, he regained it. I've never seen Dermy hit like that. Really? Not one time. No. Good I job by the lineys, up. too, to let, yeah. let, let Luch go. They let him screw off. But the thing was, did, McDermott had him, too, and then just that one Luch bomb... It's like, I didn't. I, I didn't know you've never even seen McDermott go down like that, though. Nope, nope. He always stood in there with anybody he was scrapping. And now we look forward. Where I feel like the the heavyweight rivalries have 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 came back up into play. Where you got Wi Fi in the mix. You got Delorier. Uh, you got Matt Martin over there on the East with the, with the Islanders. But the, the big one I got circled is Minnesota playing Calgary pretty soon where Revo and Luch could potentially be going at it. That would oh, be that oh to me is the ultimate heavyweight championship fight. Uh I don't know. I think I bet I bet you if you polled everybody, they would say it was a fifty fifty split between whether you're picking Lucic or or um or Revo. I hope we get to see it. And uh just circle that on your maps, guys circle them. Absolutely, man. Uh, I thought last Thursday night was one of the best nights of the season. There were 10 games being played. Nine of them had playoff ramifications. Uh, four out of those 10 went to OT, and two out of the four games that went to OT, they were tied with under a minute left, and the tying team ended up winning the game. Just all kinds of good drama. Uh, that Tampa Bay uh, Buffalo Sabres game, t- uh, was it Buffalo won 6-5 OT. Tage Thompson had a hat trick on his 40th the next game. But there was a, a little ugliness. Eric Chernak, he hit Kyle Oposo with a little chicken wing, ended up getting a two-game suspension for it. What did you think that two games should have been more, should have been less? What would you take on um, that? Kind of what I expected. I wouldn't have been shocked at three, but it was in listening to like the Tampa announcers describe the hit on replay, they were like, oh, his elbow was tucked in. It's like, no, dude, his elbow was sticking yeah. directly was the parallel dance. to the ice. Man. It buried <laughs> yeah, him in the tucked face. Tucked in his so, root canal. Yeah, that was, um, you know, and and and... If you remember the emotional discussion we, we, we had with Ocposo about his injury and, and what he went through to get healthy, you just you get scared. And um, hopefully he's doing all right. But I, I know that, that Cernix plays on an edge, right? That guy's a mean bastard on the ice. It's why he's so successful. I think even he would say he, um, he regrets that one, you know, losing a couple, a, a couple games pay. But it was a dirty hit that, that had to be suspended. And, and hearing the Tampa Bay announcers try to kind of defend it was comical. Yeah, I can't can't defend that. I mean, there's no need for it. It's, it's just a total lack of respect. And again, like you said, Oposo is a guy we got to know a little bit. You have, you know, empathy for any guy, especially when, when you meet a guy, hang out with him a little bit. So it's just know, one of those, those things of as a defenseman, you kind of, you, you, you overplay your angle a bit. And it's just like a natural reaction to stop him. You throw the elbow out. Uh, I'm sure Cher- Chernak re- regrets it, but it was a scary looking one. Yeah, no doubt about that. Uh, well, some pleasant that one on Saturday night. Patrick Malo, uh, his number 12, became the first number in Shock's history to be retired. Uh, went up to the rafters before the game versus Chicago. And 
they had a Legends game the night before, and uh, they were interviewing Jumbo, Joe Thornton, and he said, oh, I hope he scores four goals because you got to wait and see what happens if he does. <laughs> like, making a reference to his of high school four, I'm going to pull my prick out. And even, like, San Jose, the, the team Twitter accounts put it out with, like, a winking face. Like, yeah, obviously didn't say exactly what it alluded to, but I thought that was pretty funny. But either way, Patrick Marlowe, Nice to see him get the number retired. Just, uh, you know, one of the greats of the last couple decades. I think that, wait, when did that quote come about? When it was Hurdle, it was his first NHL game, and he did he did the between-the-legs goal for the for the hat trick. And then after the game, uh, uh, Joe Thornton said, fuck, if I scored four goals, I'd whip my hog out and fuck it through, through the <laughs> helicopter cock. And, may, and maybe not so many words, but I think we all know what he was saying. I think what was cool was, you know, and Patrick Marlowe, just just a classy guy, and he did it for yeah. so long, so well. But what I thought was interesting was was you hear a lot of guys, we ask people about Joe Thornton, what a team guy he is, how much he loves the boys. You see how emotional he was during the entire yeah. ceremony? And I think he knows his day's coming of his getting jersey retired. But you know he was just truly emotional about a friend, a guy he's played a long time with, seeing his jersey go up and what that means to him. And you got to imagine his career is kind of going through his mind and just – and what they went through as a twosome and, and having some great friggin' teams in San Jose. They came real close. They had other runs where they could have could have won a Stanley Cup. But um, I thought it was really cool to see a, see a longtime teammate, Joe Thornton, get emotional for a friend and, and a teammate and, and, and a brother, in a sense, and seeing Marlowe get, get his honor of having his jersey number up there forever. Yeah. Yeah, congrats to Patty. Uh, a couple more notes before we get our next interview ready here. Uh, last Tuesday on Philly, Connor McDavid's assist on uh, Leon Dreisel goal gave him 800 NHL points in his 545th game. Yeah, 545 games, the fifth fastest ever after Gretzky, Lemieux, Mike Bossy, and Peter Stastny, and the fifth youngest ever after Gretzky, Lemieux, Howachuk, and Eisenman. Guys just keep rolling along, and it was also Dreisel's 700 points on the same play. That was pretty cool. Uh, Spencer Knight's going to be out indefinitely after entering the NHLPA player assistance program. Obviously, we wish him the best and good health coming forward. Uh, the Panthers did get Anthony Duclair back uh, Friday night. He returned to the lineup, got an assist in his first game back. So it was good to see him back in the lineup. The, the crowd gave him a nice little cheer and I stuff. Wanna, I want to refrain some comments from last podcast. I said that I'd rather uh, put my cock and balls in a blender than see the Florida Panthers in playoffs. I would say that I'm going to pull those back because, as Anson Carter, Carter mentioned the other day when we were at uh, doing the TNT broadcast, he, Matthew Kachuk's having a sneaky MVP season. Connor McDavid's going to win it. We all know that. But what he's doing to galvanize that group in Florida, especially after the All Star break and the way that they've been playing, it would be fun to see if he could single handedly lead that team into playoffs and what he could do from there. Maybe, who knows? Maybe they, they pull off an upset somehow. I don't think that we, the top to bottom, really love their lineup. But with the season that he's been having, and then now you bring Duclair back, who. I mean, guys, he had 30 tucks last year. That was a big loss in the offseason when he tore his Achilles. So he's back in there. Uh, look out for the Florida Panthers. And I'm going to have to apologize for all you Panthers out, fans out there. I, 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 re I refrain from my comments. <laughs> all right. We promised you a second interview. Um, gee, you want to give a little background on this for the folks who might not have listened to the show last time? Yeah, absolutely. So last podcast, we explained this whole story. We actually posted it on social media. It went pretty viral. We had a fan come to our meet and greet in Fort Lauderdale at Bo's Pub. Uh, his name is Joe. He basically, he told the bar he was working for Barstool. He told Barstool he was working for the bar. He ran the show. The thing is, he did an incredible job. He did an amazing job, but he conned everyone. He's a, he's catch me if you can. He's Leonardo DiCaprio. And then at the end, he admitted to us that he conned his way down he basically, he didn't work for the bar. He didn't work for Barstool. And so we had him on, we interviewed him and it was basically a job interview. And I think he was, uh, I think he came out very, very likable. I'm interested to see what the fans think. Um, you'll get to listen to him now, but a good dude, a good sport, a psychopath, but uh, <laughs> listen to it now. Tell us what you think. And, and as Biz mentions at the end of the pod, a lot of this comes down to the fan base, who I will say as of right now, now before an interview, you have certain thoughts. Maybe things will change. But as of right now, our fan base are big Joe fans. That's what I kind of got. I've gotten a ton of Hiram's. I've gotten a few don't Hiram's. But we'll see what you guys think after you hear them right now. Big Deal Brewing is now available in Vermont and New Hampshire. That's right. My old stomping grounds, Match Vegas, Manchester. It's near and dear to my heart, folks. I want to call their cup there. And now you can enjoy 
the wonderful Big Deal logo. And if you're having a hard time finding it, we got you covered. You can go to BigDealBrewing.com. We have a store locator. That way, you don't have to waste any money on gas trying to find it. Big Deal Brew. Enjoy it. Vermont, New Hampshire. We are in you. Thanks for joining Joey Rabino. Well, a lot of the listeners wanted to hear from this cat after a stunt down in Florida a couple weeks back, and we were able to track him down. So welcome to the show, General Manager Joe Rubino. <laughs> what's going on, my friend? Yo, what's going on, boys? Thanks for not having me. Not that we were reffing a game, running late. What, what sport yeah, were you Yeah, actually, was, I do uh, Stony Brook. It's a ACHA D1 hockey here on the island. Um, went to fucking overtime, let alone a shootout. As soon as the shootout started, I was like, boys, I got to run. My guys in the locker room, they took care of me. They knew I had to run, so uh, they were happy to well, help they, out. Yeah, hey, we're, sure we're on your time, time buddy. buddy. Yeah, hey, well, we're on your time. Says, yeah, for everyone that wants to know, Joey delayed this interview. Hey, guys, <laughs> I need another 30 minutes. Yeah. I'm actually in the process of yeah. stealing a referee costume <laughs> yeah. from somebody else because I'm not actually a ref. <laughs> the guy says He's in the back of his trunk right now. Technically, <laughs> technically it is four-inch. <laughs> we said 4 p.m. I got the emails, Joe. Suck a dick. So Joe, Joe, so Joe, Joe, and, hey, t- and, uh, Joe, and then Joe hops on here and then say, "Hey, are we recording?" And we said, "No, not yet." And then he goes, "Well, before we hit record, this is how it's going to go. Trying to run our show on our yeah, podcast." Yeah, yeah, yeah. I he goes, felt guys, hold on, this. we're not recording. Yet. I said, GM. "Stop talking right now, Joe. We're going <laughs> to absolutely ask you whatever the fuck we want to ask you, bud." All right. <laughs> so, so let's let's go back. Um, what about two, three weeks now, mm-hmm. and. I guess the uh, the job heard around the world at Bo's Pub by you. Give us your kind of play by play on deciding to come down there and when it all came into your head that this was going to be a good idea. Yeah, so um, I'm actually interviewing with the Panthers right now uh, for a position with the organization, and I went down there to see the facility, to see the practice ring, to kind of look at apartments because I'm thinking about relocating down there. Um, I turned down a job in the past for them that wasn't really A1, and I didn't even go down there, so I didn't do my due diligence. So this time I was like, it's All-Star Weekend, Chicklets is going to be down there. Let me go down there and see what it's about, knowing you guys are going to be there. Go to the event down at the beach. Go to the skills comp. Run into RA, and I'm like, all right, I'll see you tomorrow at the event. Saturday morning rolls around. I'm the first one there. The restaurant's nowhere near ready. Right. Let me just walk around town. It starts raining sideways. And I'm like, all right, let me go post up under this canopy. And some other GM, some Fugazi, is like, oh, fuck out of here. You can't stand here. I'm like, it's fucking raining. What do you want me to do? I'm going to Bo's Pub. Walk into Bo's Pub and... uh like, what are you doing here? I'm like, oh, I'm here for the bar stool event. Playing stupid. And he's like, oh, it starts at 11. I'm like, no, no, I'm from bar stool. Did you, t- so, did you decide right then to say that or was, was that planned? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I've always wanted to work for bar stool, work for spitting chiclets. Um, going to the weekend, I packed a NHL polo to try and like work my way down to the glass, but I'm interviewing with the Panthers. So, I'm not trying to get thrown out of the arena that I want to work at. So, um, with that, I showed up to your event. I knew that I didn't mean any harm. All I wanted to do was help you guys. And I tried to address that in the email I sent you guys. Um, but overall, like working for you guys would be a dream come true. Was it the Panthers GM job? Is Bill Zito on the hot seat? Like, <laughs> what, what job exactly were you going down for? It was uh, manager youth hockey, amateur hockey. So to try and grow the game in South Florida. Interesting. When did you tell the waitresses to put on Pink Whitney t-shirts? As soon as I got there. <laughs> so at, at at that point, had anyone asked you like what you do? Like I know you had told them I'm with Barstool, but then were other people like, who are you? And then you just kind of kept repeating that. How it went was the bartender grabbed me. I went upstairs. Um, I just said, hey, I'm Joe. I'm here to help out. Kind of like left it alone. And um, one thing led to the next, and they're like, oh, so you're with Barstool? I'm like, yeah, I'm with Barstool. Like, fucking Viva La Stool. Like, absolutely. Um, Password. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just, I, oh, yeah, I've worked other events in the past. 
we had the one in, in Manhattan, the Pink Whitney release party, which I was at helping out taking photos in the podcast that we that you guys did. I'm already saying wait. Um, that you guys did. <laughs> like you reference a guy taking photos at the event and helping along. And I was there with that kid, but I got fucking wasted that night. And I was like, I need to step away and made it up to the VIP and was like drinking with you guys. But that was it. And I, I went home that night thinking like, damn, I blew my shot. Like I wanted to talk to them, show them like what I can do for them. And I just, I just got drunk and, and I, I couldn't do anything at that yeah, point. Yeah, we already have an RA. Dude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With- yeah, we, we already got a guy that does that. So, so for my understanding is you went down there with no intention of, of doing what you eventually did. You were planning on going to the Pink Whitney event. And when you got there and you fell under these circumstances where you just kept using these vague terms, like, yes, I work for Barstool, you found yourself in this lie. Like, how did it, how did it snowball? And when did it click to you where you were going to keep going with this whole charade? Yeah. So it definitely snowballed like initially i was like all right like let me just help the boys out and you know maybe i'll hop into uber with them and go to the game and i didn't have a media credential so i'm like i could get into their suite right Pardon? um <laughs> and like you're talking about you try to put your name on my hotel room too and like get a fucking room key bud yeah so you set up my surprise 40th birthday party too <laughs> but... i was there actually i was uh i was one of the de- deck hands tying off the boat <laughs> <laughs> where, where did I see you at the skills competition? When, so you, so I was outside of the, on suite level and ran into you. We took the elevator down. You were looking for like Yanza's family, I think. You just kept saying, I got a schmooze with, with the fams or whatever. Oh, yeah. And All right. Um, All right. So I'm like it. walking around with you. We're, we're shooting the shit. And um, I actually, I, I'm not surprised you don't remember. Probably get a hundred different people walking up to you, but. I showed you I had like a tin of Romeo and Juliet's and I told you like I had smokes for you, but last minute I was like bugging. I was like, you know what? Like, let me not bring weed on the plane. Um, and that was it. And I, I was like, listen, like I, I had it ready to go. The pre-rolls ready for you and just didn't. So did you feel so, like you let down? I was going to pay for a blowjob for you, but I decided not Biz, to. to. To bring <laughs> weed on a plane, whatever. It's not even the biggest thing they're in the world. I'm pretty smokes. sure TSA no, only look. looks for explosives. But when you're heading down for a job interview, exactly. it's <laughs> amazing to think that you even thought about it. <laughs> yeah. uh, sorry, Bill Zito. I'm going to miss that. I'm in prison. Um, <laughs> I, I had a pound of balls. weed in my carry-on along with my Chicklets t-shirts. Zito walks into his office. There's a cloud of smoke. He's like, "What the fuck is going on? You have a seat here, Bill. He he's sitting in Bill's seat. <laughs> Why don't you have okay, a seat so, here, Bill? Um. Then when we arrived, like I mentioned on the pod, I'm sure you've heard. I mean, super impressed with the GM of Bo's Pub, which happens to be Joey Rabino. And when you started talking to me, like we got this, we got that. Is that? Is that when you were like, all right, I'm all in on this? Or had it even happened before that where you were running the entire show? You're saying at the event? Yeah, like when 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 you met Biz and I and then you really? started kind of not bossing us around but really like telling us what was up yeah. to the point where we were like, hey, great job, man. Is that when you like agreed or told yourself I'm all in right now? I mean, I was there three hours before you guys. I'm, I'm telling everyone what to do. I'm running drinks. Um... You know, and uh, like you said, it kind of just like snowballed into one uh, one thing led to the next. And again, it started out as, you know, maybe I'll, I'll just like hitch a ride and, and party with them at the All-Star game. And then Biz is like, oh, I'm flying out of here. Wits, like I'm flying out of here. And I'm like, you know what? Like I'm I'm fucking helping keeping this this event going because they were in over their head. They were not prepared. Like I've been working events for a long time and and uh you know, I I don't want to take all the credit, but like I whipped that. <laughs> well, how, what, what, what did they screw up on? Like, what, what were they so bad at that you yeah, saved the day? Yeah, let's hear it. Give us your list. I don't want to rip on them, but like, well, yeah, you already did. You might as well finish. You, you, oh, yeah. We've already ripped on them enough, dude. You basically saved the day. You're like Gallo a, doesn't you're like exist a anymore. Knight. You're like a there's, shining knight. You can dog Bo's pub at this point. There's no more New Amsterdam. It's done. You ruined them. <laughs> Uh, just like everything, they were completely understaffed, right? So there was two bartenders upstairs, one and a half downstairs, zero security there. So I'm thinking like you're you're about to have like four or five hundred people show up, and 
I'm like looking around. I'm like, I wonder what your like fire code is for for people in here because it's gonna be packed to the gills. And then doors open, and all of a sudden it's like, holy shit! Like they're definitely not ready. So I hold the line. I'm like, let's get like 20 people upstairs and just see how it goes. Right away, instant line all the way to the stairs. Lines down to the stairs. I'm like, okay. Now we have two lines going because we had people in the dining room. Then we also had people on the staircase, right? Basically got rid of the staircase line or got rid of the line from the dining room, got the staircase line going. And all of a sudden people are still asking Leslie like, hey, I have a reservation. I have a reservation. I should be allowed upstairs. That's when like, okay, shut down open table. And then it was... You know, I've been here for two hours and I'm in the dining room, but I'm not allowed on the line. So you so. were dealing with customer complaints. Everybody wanted a piece yeah. of the boys and you were kind of, you were, you were playing the middleman and you were diffusing a lot of stuff for us. So that's, that's huge. So, but fast forwarding. So your adrenaline's going, right? Obviously you're playing this, this whole lie out. At what point did you notice the dominoes falling? And, 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 and at that point, w- in what direction did you end up bringing it? Is that the time that you went to the bathroom and let Grinelli know while he was hosing that you fucking took over this whole event? Pretty much, yeah. Like, because I knew my cover was blown. So <laughs> I I was, like, looking for one of you guys. Wit had already ducked out. Um, pretty sure you were already outside. And, like, I fully intended on, like, coming clean about it because I don't want to be known as, like, a liar or like or, like, a sneak or, like, I didn't cheat anybody i got into a free event like i didn't take any money i didn't collect any tips like i didn't do anything like that like literally just there to help you guys out so when my i back saw was, you ask my mother-in-law for her number bro what are you talking about <laughs> i'm just you know, kidding well ra is asking my mother for her number <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah, right, for buddy. i that's all right. it. Okay. Fucking ricochet. Hey, which is weird because I asked fucking RA for her his mom's number. So I guess we're all even here. <laughs> all right. Circle. Okay. So well, like Ben said though, triangle going. When did you? Re- when was the cover blown? Was it when Grinelli saw the bartender be like, "Yo, what's your name again?" Like nah, you mentioned I something like that. No. Nah, so the somebody from Bo's Pub, like their head of social, came up to me and was like, "Hey, can I get like four or five T-shirts for the kitchen and dish crew?" I'm like, "Yeah, of course." Like. They deserve it. Like, they're running food. They're doing whatever. Like, the staff is all wearing shirts. Like, let's help them out. Go behind the step and repeat board. Open up the box of t-shirts that was there that was supposed to be for the fans. And, you know, pulled out a couple different sizes, handed it to them, and that was it. Then I tell one of the girls from Barstool, I'm like, hey, by the way, like, um, I just gave a, a handful of shirts to the dish crew and kitchen. And she's like, no, you're not supposed to do that. Like, who are you? Those aren't your shirts. You had, so you kind of ratted yourself Uh, out a little bit. Had you not said anything? Yeah, I thinking I'm doing the right thing. And she's like, those aren't your shirts. Touch, like, who are you? I'm like, ah, fuck. So now, (laughs) she goes and double checks with someone from the restaurant, and they're like, wait, which person are you talking about? He said he was from Barstool. So now I'm like, damn. Yeah, then you know it all now well, I gotta go you know grab what? Grinelli's then, hog while he's hosing. Yeah, yeah. So then what I, happened? Well, I already had the Uber set up on my phone. Like Merle's is asking, like, "Hey, who's got the Uber?" And I'm like, "I do," you know, like. And she's like, "You should probably just leave." I'm like, "I'm not leaving." Like, if you would have known what this place would have been like without me here, like, I'm not, I'm not fucking leaving. So you, so at that point when you got busted, you kind of went on the offense, which is that's a little yeah. bit like the. That's where we that's where we kind of worry about the wires crossing and, and maybe the dead bodies in the trunk type stuff. That's well, where busy, we, we get he's a little... not only like Leonardo DiCaprio and Catch Me If You Can, but he's also like Leo in Wolf of Wall Street where he ain't <laughs> fucking leaving. I'm not fucking leaving. <laughs> okay, so, so he, here's another one I got for you. And I will say this uh, and back you up. I You came down to explain this story when I was in the parking lot waiting for a cab with McQuaid. Yeah, and you put my you shredded, mind in though, a complete. You? I I hadn't slept yet. I I was sleeping during the Rob Brindamore interview. I do yeah. the two hour appearance, and then I got this guy in the parking lot handing me a business card, a female's business card. I don't think it was anybody from Bo's Pub. I don't think it was anybody from Gallows. It was some random female's business card, and you'd written your name on it in red lipstick. Now, what the fuck was that about? All right, so. Um, that business card was Leslie Grossman's. She's the director of Bo's Pub. And 
after I got Boston, after I already talked to Grinnell in the bathroom, um, I grabbed, she handed me her two business cards, right? And I wrote my name on it and I was like, listen, like Leslie, like, I'm so sorry I lied to you. And she's like, what do you mean? I'm, I'm like, listen, I wasn't really from Barasul. Like, I'm just trying to show these guys like, I like that I want to work for them. And she's like, oh my God, you absolutely killed it, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, will you vouch for me like if they call you and she's like absolutely like you were amazing you helped me out and she's like a sweet lady and I felt terrible that I lied to her but like again like I didn't I didn't steal anything I didn't take anything like I didn't collect any money and like so she hands me her business cards like if you ever want to come work for us like come on back down I'm like I'm from Long Island like I'm not fucking coming to work at a restaurant so I'm like, all right, let me like write my name down on the card and like hand them to you guys and like be like, call this lady. Like she will vouch for me. Like, I'm sorry I lied. And that's basically when I saw you and I was like, let me try and get this across to you. All right. So then <laughs> I read the email with the resume yeah. and what you did, the list close to 20 things. And like I've said before, just an outstanding job you did do. Yeah. And I also tweeted like, I want to hate you, but I actually really like you. I want to hate you. I told my friends back home the story. They thought it was one of the funniest stories ever. They hate everyone, and they like you. Your mother's email. You wrote that email, correct? From my mother? Yes. Look at the wording, bro. I, I write fucking I poetic. She she didn't even put an email signature. That I'm makes like, me no, that I... makes me believe that it was you, though. I feel like you're, you're a smart guy that I knows to spell a few words. Or this guy is willing to throw his mom under the bus so bad that he wants his job. I kind of want to hear him out here. She she cares, right? All she cares. I get yeah, that. Yeah, she doesn't want you living in her house anymore, <laughs> dude. That's a fact. Um, no I more room for corpses. Her because so she so she commented on the Instagram post, which I have to say, shout out Chicklet fans, thirty thousand fucking likes on a post. I got more likes than Tarasenko. I got more likes than Ryan O'Reilly trade. Like this is fucking groundbreaking, and I got more likes than both of these guys. Yeah. Come on. So overwhelming support from Chicklets fans. Shout out to you guys. I'm scrolling through. Hire my son. He's the best. He he his resume is legit. How is she? I text her immediately. <laughs> Delete your fucking comment. Are you kidding? A couple days later, or a week later, you guys post another uh episode and I'm like, please like bring it up. Please bring it up. Like all of a sudden, we got an email from this kid's mom. I'm like, you got to be kidding me, right? I text her. I'm like, did you fucking email them? She's like, yeah, this is what I said. I'm like, why do you have to get involved? You know, but again, she she means well. She She's a sweetheart, you know. If we um, were to hire you, could we use her as, as a reference to call? Yeah, absolutely. That's where I get my travel, um, you know, uh, experience from because she was a travel agent for a while, so... I did the travel work for my college club team. So I, I know all the ins and outs of like, you know, what to look out for, what not to look out for. Um, staying in a hotel where like when there's pictures of the room and stuff, like obviously make sure there's a flat screen TV on the walls, like updated art. The, the carpet doesn't have jizz stains on it, stuff like that. So I was just going to ask RA and, and, and Wit, are you guys opposed to maybe doing right now a short uh, job interview? Maybe no, just some not question. at all. That's kind of what that's kind of what I was going to get into in the fact that Ra brought up a good point that I had uh, also thought of, but he mentioned first in terms of like, all right, if this guy works for us, we could have every single Chicklets lunatic popping out of the woodwork, breaking into events, and being an absolute lunatics in doing what you did. So that's a little bit of a worry. And the other thing is like, what would you do for us? Like, do you yeah. have any idea of what you would want to do, what you think you could do? Because in terms of, like, your personality and what you did, it is pretty impressive. I like talking to you. You can bust balls. But right. I, I have no idea what you would do. That's that's yeah. the only question. And I've been thinking about that, too, you know. And um, none of the Chiglis fans have my resume, like, flat out. I was with the Islanders for seven years. I was I worked for Matt Martin running his events. I worked for Steve Valiquette doing NHL film and analytics, shot sequencing. Um, I have a college degree. I don't know if Biz has ever seen one of these. Maybe on the oh. wall, like an AS, <laughs> in an ASU, like I'm fucking obsessed with this guy. room. Um, you go? Well, Arizona two of us State. don't have degrees. One guy's from North Adams State. The other guy's Plymouth State. So basically, we have one full degree between the four of us. <laughs> yeah. There you go. And I can make a second one. Um, if, for those of you wanting like a background check that I'm actually going to kill you, 
This is my USA Hockey refing card. Um, oh, oh, they, that's oh okay. Great. In that case, they they run <laughs> back the Texas T Sports certified. I got it. Uh, I got to re up that every year. Um, so that's just for like the, in the background. for the way that parents talk to you guys. I wouldn't be surprised if you end up killing us because you got to get it out at somebody. It's like Ned Flanders finally snapping. Yeah, right. No, um, being a ref is great for all those parents. Like, fuck you. Go usahockey.com slash become an official. Um, go try and get your level one certification because. It's not easy being a ref, but we need more refs out there. Uh, no doubt. And no it's, doubt. It's what a fucking rewarding. showed up. But, and um, on top of that, not to hop in, gee, like this guy could ref at the ball hockey tournaments. So this man, you are the- We need refs at the Chicklets Cup, too, you are so the, you could run that. Eh, hey, he's the, like, no, nah, I'm all set with that, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I thought huh. I'd be playing in it. Fuck. No, oh, I'll ref it. Go goodness. ahead. Yeah, so what I could do for you guys, like, there is some stuff that I could say, like, off air- that I don't want to fully disclose to you guys just yet because I want to give Which, like certain so ideas people? away. Uh, so pre pre COVID, I literally want to kill myself for this. Pre COVID, I wrote down twenty five different things that I could do for chiclets, and I literally threw out that sheet of paper like a month ago. Um, but why? And, and cool. Honestly, like I was just clearing <laughs> my room out, and it was in a folder, and I was like, oh, like remember when I. I was sitting in a cubicle doing this, and I literally was just like, threw it out. I st- like there, there, there has to be a few things that you remember from the list. What would be one of them? What would be a, one of your biggest things that you would fix about checkouts right now? So as far as like your your live events go, right? The biggest thing that I saw was like, it's it's almost anarchy, and it, there's no there's no like direction, and and that's what I was there doing, like facilitating. Like you said to me, Biz, Biz you were like. Hey, you got to be the bad guy. Like, you got to shuffle these people along. Like, you need that. When you went to Carolina, there was a video on Chicklets where, like, you're holding a, a tray of shots and there's like seven fucking savages, like, pulling shots from you. It's like, boys, like, back it up. Like, let's, let's have some, like, nice, like, flow to this. Like, set it up the way it's supposed to be done. Um, like, pre event meetings, post event meetings. What could we do better? What, what do we learn from this event? What worked? What didn't work? Um, I'm not too sure like how you guys operate as it is, but I've been working events in the past and like there's ways to do things and there's ways not to do things. There's, there's intangibles that I could bring to the table. And as far as like, um, like moving forward and like for the pod, like I don't want to be on camera. I don't want to necessarily like steal your spotlight. Like I said in the initial <laughs> email, because what do I have? Fucking 400 followers on Instagram. Nobody cares. You know, you guys are, are absolutely killing it. Um, one of the things I think we could do is just continue to grow the game. You know, as a referee, like I got little kids coming to the hockey rink, like wearing spit, like spit and chiclets gear. Like moms are in, in the stands, like wearing like pink Whitney toques, like, the game is like growing and like spin chicklets is like killing it. So like I just think overall we need to like facilitate like more areas and continue to grow. I should do a kids podcast for the kids for all the minor hockey league players where there's no swearing. <laughs> is that what you're maybe maybe that? No, that you do you do a phenomenal job not swearing. I, I want to clear something up too. When you say when you say be, when I say be the bad guy, it's yeah. because sometimes the events are planned for an hour and a half. And there's yeah. two and a half to three hours of people to say hello to and make sure they get their picture. So that's yeah. why we just like, at a certain point, like if we you know spend 15 minutes with each person, nobody's going to end up getting all their pictures. No, I, so I com- so, I completely agree, and okay. it sucks because you're like you guys are all so genuine and like good guys that you want to have that conversation, build a relationship with your fans, and even at Bo's Pub, like there was 15 minutes left in the event, and there was still a line down to the street. You know, and there was no way we were going to get to those people. I, I asked I asked Stevie <laughs> why this same question, and uh, you know, he, he gave me some good in, insight. What do you do outside of work to relax and decompress? Let's not talk about work right now. What are you doing yeah. with your free time? He's this, like, remember, you ever seen the show interview. Dexter? <laughs> Dexter's a good show. Um, I like uh, you know walks in the park. I have a I have a border collie needs a lot of energy taken out, so I, I walk him. I go mountain biking with the boys, um, skate, you know, at the local park, um, ice hockey, refing, you know, the basics. 
All right, do you have a question? Yeah, do you have a hospitality background that you worked in restaurants uh, uh, before that you have so familiar with how things should be run, or at least you think? I have a degree from from college, like, in public relations, and, like, guest services kind of, like, ties into that. Um, Never really worked in, like, a restaurant um, atmosphere, but uh, my girlfriend has, and, like, she's always telling me, like, (laughs) what to do, what not to do kind of things. Um, And it's, like, just being genuine, but also, um, you know, People at events are there to have a good time. So we're always looking to, um, you know, make sure all the areas are covered, especially at like our Matt Martin events, right? So like you want to make sure the dishes are being cleared, cups are being cleared, and uh, garbages aren't overflowing. It's not really something that you need like a restaurant background in. It's more just seeing things that need to get done. And one thing about me is like I always try and go above and beyond like the call of duty, right? So if I'm here for an event, like I'm still, I, I, I'm taking out the trash because I'm not going to say like, oh, the janitor needs to do that. Like no job is too little. What, I like what that. illegal activities has Lou Lamorello had you do for him in the past? Um, so I'm not going to touch on the Lou situation because uh, for it's, other he reasons. He could be a mole. He could be a mole, guys. Yeah. Not a mole, but... Um, just some I, stuff that we can't hear right now. Yeah, I could tell you guys some stuff off air. Um, okay. But okay. there are some things that. Wait, wait so are not. you currently still close with Lou, or has the relationship fizzled? No, I, I've, I'm not talking to him. Okay, you um, guys are not speaking to him. Have you ever gone to an event and told the restaurant you were with the Islanders, and then told the Islanders you were with the restaurant similar to this fashion? No, but I've I've been working with the Islanders for so long that I've done so many different events, restaurants, block parties, meet and greets. Um, all that stuff is like second nature to me. So so what I'm thinking right now, and now this is by no means like a guarantee or anything, like there's going to be discussion between all of us. And Grinelli really is kind of the final say guy when it comes to our events and stuff like that. But in thinking, you could be the guy that is sent ahead to really set things up. I know we've sort of had that, but that's something that comes to mind. Other mm-hmm. than that, we'll have to discuss. I don't know if you have anything else to say. I don't know if the boys have any other questions. It's been interesting. It's been nice getting to to know you a little bit on here. I still think yeah. you're crazy, but a good a good crazy, I'll say. He, he did call all. our fans savages with when they were reaching over for the Pink Whitney. I take that as a compliment. When we go to these events, oh, yeah. they they, they oh, are, yeah. are rapid, and I think that they're they're like wild animals. Much like the warthog we got over here, RA. So sometimes <laughs> I like the, the aspect of security, but I also let them like to let them roam free, like wild animals should. So Grinnell, it always goes back to you. I mean, it's there's always room for improvement, and we want to make sure everybody's experience is the the best one. Yes. What, what's your feeling on all this? I would like an elevator pitch in 23 words or less. Let's see what you got. <laughs> 23 I mean, words or less. 23 words. There's four. That breath counts as one. Take your time. Don't, don't feel roll? rushed. Take a deep breath, buddy. This is... Put the music on. We do three-hour pods. This could be a 15-minute break. Everybody can do some breathing exercises. I'll be there before and after your events to make sure everything went absolutely A1. I mean, that's fucking under 23. He's efficient. Was, He's efficient, okay. boys. Saves time. That we, need that. Oh, we need that. We need that. We need that. We would oh. also have to maybe get clearance from uh, Ashley. That's the girl that was maybe a little bit spooked out when she found out this yeah. random fan came and, and pretended he had two jobs in which he didn't have any of them. Uh, the red lipstick on the business card, I'm still scratching my head about that one. Uh, we're probably going to have to maybe put you through some more testing all right, is there any final question you want to ask him before we, we, we end this? We potentially interview your mom for a, a secondary option just to get some references. Yes. And then, of course, we're going to have to consult with the fan base because the fan base we are should the- give it, we should, He should have to do Wingate VO2. We should put him through like a draft combine. <laughs> that I is- thought this was going to be like a kangaroo court. I thought it would be in a locker room somewhere, you know, ass naked. But no, in my okay, email, yeah. I actually did apologize to Ashley. Um, I did feel bad. Like I wasn't trying to like make her look bad. Um, and like again, like I, my best intentions were at heart, and I was just there trying to help you guys and like protect the brand because, like, if if I wasn't there, like, 
who knows what would have happened and it would have been like some really like unhappy fans and i just didn't want that to happen you know um so i i'm fine with like whatever like you guys want to do like moving forward um i'm i'm down for whatever you know joe what, what about people think you, you you may have like credibility issues you know considering like you had a bullshit people to get we get we out what's your response to that i think that's bullshit because um you know these days it's it's all about who you know and and sometimes like the hardest working people like they don't even get a shot and i'm willing to be that person for you guys and a lot of people they only look out for themselves you know i consider myself to be the you know the most for the boys person in the world i even have a fucking tattoo for the boys um so strike you know, to, to those people who who think that you know i don't deserve it that's fine like they they're just upset that they didn't think of it first would you get a little chicklets logo as a tear a teardrop <laughs> yeah, a pink a pink uh teardrop you would you a for us you my, godmother, my godmother might disown me i don't know she, she said whatever tattoo is just nothing on the hands or above the collar. So you so. get a you get a spit and chickles tramp stamp, a pink Whitney head logo tramp stamp of the Aki of the, going down the the arse. No, like the the our logo right on the tramp stamp area. That's the, pushing the, it. The, the 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 first thing that I could think of as a tester, and I completely respect everything you did, and and you coming on here and conducting the way the, the, yourself the way you have, like. I want to give you an opportunity. We are going to have to do more due diligence. I said that, but absolutely. We, we speak of events and Grinnell has set up one of the biggest ones in the history of spit and chicklets coming up at the UBS arena mm -hmm. on Long Island. That's a fucking home game for you. But I have to ask you, like, I know that you said that you and Lou are no longer on speaking terms. But we're also going into his house and yeah. I don't know how much you listen to the podcast. He in fact sent his son over to uh, Arizona during Super Bowl to issue a death threat towards me. Would it's you potentially act as security for us going into UBS arena? I would expect that all of us have to have bulletproof vests on. You yeah, would have and to. And we be already have one guy, Pasha, who's banned from the NHL. So, I are you currently banned from UBS Arena by any chance, or does no? He, no. Yeah. Does, does he no, have a I'm, restraining I'm all, order? I'm not on, on the, like no fly list or anything like that. Um, I I still have a great relationship with my contacts at the Islanders. Um, things just didn't really end well with with them. You know, I I was there for for seven years, still working part time. You know, I was pushing you know, as long as I could, uh, as hard as I could working part time, my year to date was like $5,000. So I always had to have like some other part time or full time job during the day that never panned out because I was like on a Thursday, like, hey, it's a game day. Can I leave at three o'clock? And they're like, everyone else wants to leave at three o'clock. Like, why the fuck do you get to? You know, I, I've had so many other jobs like to try and chase this dream of working with the Islanders. And it just like never really panned out. I thought by the by like 10 years, I'd be traveling with the team doing player relations. Um, and I had a great relationship with them and like the players and the families and things like that. Um, it just never like. Joe, you don't have to explain yourself. Lou's never been good at assessing real talent, buddy. But here at Spit and Chicklets, uh, we just... can. And we know. And we know it when we see it. And they didn't give you the opportunity. Now, you talk about all this hard work you put in for him. Were they compensating you properly? I went through different ownership, different coaching staff different GM and you know little by little like things started to change like John Ledeck he's great like he he started to take care of the employees at the end of the day but like seven years and you see three interns get bumped up from intern to part-time to full-time it's like fuck man like what am I doing here you know and I still got buddies that work for the team and it's like yo you're still going to games like and then they're, they're like not hiring you like come on you know it's just it's not fair to, to, to these it's kids that fair. are like our students and then working and then working a second job and they say oh we like to hire from within and but you don't and i did my due diligence on you before this interview and i heard you actually did a fantastic job with the islanders i heard you no absolutely shit, crush gee. it with them so hearing this that's that's frustrating I, I understand why you would be pissed off at them but in particular i was told that you did an amazing job handling the wives and girlfriends what specifically so, did you do with pardon? them pardon <laughs> oh, oh Jesus! No. Well, I Back will, it up. I will defend my wags. Wonder Tavares left. <laughs> I will defend my wags till the day I die. I've never once said a bad thing about them. Guys in the locker room, you know, when I ref, they're like, "Oh, like who's the hottest?" I'm like, "Fuck you!" Like I'm not some fucking sleazeball. Like they're my clients, basically, right? 
and um i was assigned to family room and wives suite right so uh i was kind of like security you know helping them out helping new players transition to the arena families things like that um and you know i just, I just had a great relationship with them and i uh, you know i could tell you some stories off air but um you know overall like they're all great and um they actually shop in my boy's liquor store in garden city shout out garden city wine and spirits uh, um, no free shout outs no free during job interviews no you can shout out pink whitney though because that's the reason that you're potentially gonna get a job with us you should be shouting out pink whitney gallo shout in out new pink amsterdam whitney. if you knew how much pink whitney we go through in the summertime it is my girlfriend's favorite drink bro that's no matter where we go pink whitney no all right vodka pink lemonade. Right. you know would she everywhere. get a tramp stamp for us Mike. She's already got one of Joe's face. <laughs> and no, no, no. It says GM. <laughs> but it comes off in the Sucked shower. on that wit. Well, uh, All right. Hey, listen. I, I think this has been pretty solid. In terms of how this interview could have gone, this could have been an absolute disgrace for you. And it could have been one of those things where the listeners are like, no chance. Now we heard his voice. We want nothing to do with him. In terms of being one of the hosts, I completely feel the opposite. So I'm guessing listeners will as well. So let's 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 you know reconvene. We'll discuss. We got the VO two. We got the Wingate. Then maybe another test. I was thinking is RA. You have to do like all the drugs and alcohol he does one night. And if you could stay awake as long as he can, that would be a passing grade. Because the guy's an absolute workhorse. Deal. He's got he's got stamina coming out of his ear holes in terms of how much this man can do. <laughs> so there's a bunch of different tests we will have. We'll continue to do some background research. But overall, I, I consider this interview a success for yourself, bud. I appreciate that. And I appreciate you guys having me on. And, you know, I, you, you guys want to say what you want to say and, and joke about what you want to say. And, I, you know, I read some of the comments and they're like, oh, drug test this kid, like whatever. He's on some Northern Long Island powder, like never done coke in my life, like kept my nose clean. Like I'm still pursuing a, a career in officiating. You know, I would love to get up to the D1 level, go work IHF, um, some international hockey and you know, even the A, like I got boys in the A right now and, and that's a dream for me, you know, so it would be awesome, like trying to facilitate you guys and then also, uh, you know, skating some games uh, along the way. Um, it, it would be really cool. All right, bud. Um, all right. We will be in touch. Never done a uh, Continue to grind. Honestly, in, in all seriousness, it, it sounds like you're somebody who's kind of been grinding for quite a long time. And as crazy as this move was, it did show a lot of drive, a lot of commitment. And it's something that um, I am impressed by. So we appreciate go, b b all things withstanding. We really appreciate your help that day because that was, like I said, the smoothest yeah. meet and greet we've ever had. And that was mainly because of you. So thank you. And, and we'll be in touch. Thank you. Cool. I Sounds want good. one promise, though. What do you if got? Lou, if Lou and the Islanders <laughs> come crawling back because they want your work ethic and they want to bring you back on board, you minute bowl them and say, ah, 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 ah. I'm property of spit and Tumbo. chicklets now. Listen, they'll be lucky if they make the playoffs right now. Kane oh. to the Rangers. Let's fucking go. <laughs> That's Let's go. Saying. I hope they do. So they get 88 on Broadway. So are you a Rangers fan? That so I grew up a Ranger fan. My dad is a carpenter for like 30 years. He basically built Manhattan. So he was always <laughs> preaching this. <laughs> no oh. shit. Your dad yeah. built what MSG. He, he's a mobster. So he didn't build MSG, but he built like a lot of surrounding buildings. He built a couple like the sky. He like literally put up skyscrapers in, in Manhattan, waking up 3 a.m. to go get a parking spot at 4 a.m. to sleep in his car till fucking his shift started. Like the dude's a legend, right? So I grew up a Ranger fan. Fast forward college. And then all of a sudden a pro club offers you a job. It's like, ah, like I can't turn this down because I'm a fuck the Islanders, you know, but. I would like maybe leave. they knew so maybe they soul. knew the deep down love of the Rangers and that's why you never got that that kind of nah, bigger job like, you hope for maybe they that's something Lou would know he would know I don't know like there are some stories about Charles Wong like RIP but like he, if you had like a like a Rangers <laughs> like uh, if you had a like a Rangers like uh bumper sticker or like license plate like logo like he would literally like tow your car to the other side of the parking lot like that man was a savage um but like i would leave for work like wearing like a ranger um an islander's polo and my dad would be like yo take that shit off like nah -uh, not in here i'm like i'm going to work like come on dad i didn't build manhattan for you to wear that shit literally <laughs> we're, we're vanderbilt son i'm getting paid two and a half dollars an hour to wear this dad 
Uh, Leave me yeah. alone. Yeah. All right, buddy. This has been right. awesome. Our Thanks, age Chicklets fans are going to decide, and uh, and maybe they'll have a test that they want you to go through. Yep. Sounds Chicklets like a fans run the show here, baby. So thanks I'll be again, ready for and it. Uh, I'll keep that uh, business card in hand. Sounds good, boys. Well, there he is, the GM Joe. Uh, let us know what you think. Should we hire him? Not hire him? What, what will you take on? It was like he's a character. You got to say kind that. Of cocky he, uh, he was, in a good way. I like that little, little bit. bit of cockiness, little little bit of an edge. Um, yeah. But it was an interesting but a, interview. But a big heart. And and, and yeah. the biggest takeaway was how he, he outed himself. And it was when he gave away the Pink Whitney t-shirts to the cooks and staff in the back. And, you know, it just it just shows that he's got a big heart. And that's why I think a lot of our fan base are on his side. So I, I think that the, it's just a matter of time before this guy's got a bulletproof vest on and putting Lou Lamarillo in an armbar. Yeah, so uh, let us know what you think, and uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, gee, we have a new episode of Gay Notes dropping uh, Thursday, correct, Amundo? That is correct. Thursday morning, we have a new episode uh, dropping on the YouTube channel. And then Merles and I also have a video when we were in Arizona uh, last week. We we went to ASU. We toured Mullet Arena, not from the Yotes uh, perspective. We toured it from the uh, ASU hockey team perspective. We, we had Josh Doan show us around, show us how unbelievable their new facility is. So that video is dropping on Wednesday. It's a really cool thing that we want to keep doing. We want to go to these colleges, check out their facilities, show the world what they have to offer. And uh, Greg Powers is the man. He's doing an unreal job at ASU. He's awesome. Brought that that program from a club team now to one. I call it the mecca of college hockey. So we're excited for this video to drop. It's uh, it's it's really cool. Uh, what's the latest on the next sandbag? Do we have a hot date for that? Give or take March 15th. We're, we're saying March 15th right now, but you never know with Posh. And uh, Biz, well, he's battling big, online with Rangers fans. He's he editing. <laughs> Did we read his tweet out? His tweet is nuts. Avery, I, I mean, he has somewhat of a point. Okay, so he said, NYR are a graveyard where washed up players go for their careers to die. And then he listed a bunch of names. He put Holik, Drury, Redden, Gomez, Naslin, Richards, Gabarik, Nash, St. Louis, Tarasenko. And then he put only fitting for Kane to go there. That's a troll tweet. I mean, I think Rick Nash had the most goals in his career one season in New York. Uh, I think Gabrick won a Stanley Cup after being on the Rangers, and he also lit it up in New York. So there's some names on there who certainly were on the back nine and maybe didn't play up to their potential. But that's a guy who's just looking to start the battle early. Oh, with, you mean with Pasha fans. talking out of his ass? Oh, no, you don't say. <laughs> um, I am a little bit nervous, though, with them getting Timo Meyer. And I didn't touch on it earlier. I have a I, I I was spouting off online just like Pasha saying that if the New Jersey Devils make the Eastern Conference Finals in the next two years, so this year and next, I will get a tattoo on my ass of the Devils mad mascot. I I hold true to every single one of my bets unless they involve my dick, which <laughs> I didn't end up chopping off my foreskin, but that was because my doctor told me that it would be a horrible idea and there was a lot of risk associated to that. So Snuffleupagus is staying, but if New Jersey does make the Eastern Conference Finals, I will be getting uh, a devil mascot tattoo on my ass in Atlanta because that's where I'll be when the Eastern Conference Finals are going on. Maybe Charles Barkley can hold my hand while we're doing it. <laughs> uh, also, Biz, Big Deal Brew now available in uh, New Hampshire and Vermont, correct? Absolutely. So next, because this podcast is ran so long, uh, it is available in more states. We're going to give you every single state next podcast along with news as to where you can get it. Uh, it, easy, it is easy in most states to find it on the store locator. You can go to bigdealbrewing.com. Uh, store lo locator is pretty easy to use. You put in your area code and you can put in the mileage and it'll tell you the closest stores to get it around, around your area. Um, it is available on some uh, driving services. Is that uh, delivery Drizzly. services like GoPuff? GoPuff. Uh, yeah, Drizzly, okay. those types of uh, services. Um, so check out... Uh, check that out on the website and as far as Canada is concerned we are going to have an update very soon guys we are doing everything we can um Canada is very strict when it comes to alcohol coming in their country Healthcare is free there so they do look out for these types of things but the good news is, is it will be available probably in the next three months in select provinces we will have an update in the next few weeks thank you so much for your patience if you have had a chance to try it, we appreciate you guys supporting our beer and our alcohol brand along with Pink Whitney. So to the moon, uh, thank you all. And uh, that's pretty much all I got for this and podcast. And Game Notes, like we mentioned, will be dropping Thursday this week. Check out Merle's and Arm Dog and, and all their shenanigans the past month. And uh, 
next week, the deadline will be over. Kane should be a Ranger. There'll probably be some other sneaky moves nobody even thought about, and we'll break all those down next Tuesday. We'll be right back, getting ready for this stretch drive, playoff hockey on the horizon. We'll talk to you guys soon. Love you.